of expanding as Indeed. they go. And, and this is the point, that, that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be dealing in increments as much as possible, uh, putting together building blocks um, to give people the entire story so that people have the access uh, to the information in its raw form. For instance, tonight we're going to be uh, relying heavily on an excellent book called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. Um, that book is by Alfred W. McCoy, and uh, it is currently, I believe, out of print. Uh, it is available still in some places, and you can usually find it in libraries. But um, instead of just uh, popping through it and hitting a couple of uh, a couple of paragraphs out of the entire book, we're going to be going into it extensively because it was really the groundbreaking work um, in this field of talking about the uh, the relationship of drugs to uh, to power politics. And uh, as a result, what we're going to be doing tonight is really largely concentrating almost entirely on the uh, the shift over of the, uh, the the Asian heroin trade into the hands of Western intelligence. Um, we're not going to have any time tonight to talk about cocaine, which is a huge factor. And cocaine in politics is a, is, a, is a gigantic issue that we're not even going to be able to tackle this time, um, which is why, as Dave mentioned, this is a three and possibly four part series. We'll be going around the horn, I guess you could say. We're going to be talking at great length. In fact, an entire broadcast will be what an entire Radio Free America show will be devoted to the influence of the CIA and military in promoting LSD. You really literally cannot separate out the military and the CIA from LSD, despite the Oh, I guess the, the, the counterculture overtones that that drug acquired in the 60s and 70s. The fact of the matter is, everywhere you look with LSD and its development or use, one finds the military and the intelligence services. So we'll be, we'll be dealing with the, I, I don't know if you could say the entire, uh, cornucopia of pharmacology, but we're gonna be, we're gonna be covering a lot of the so-called recreational drugs that are, uh, in use in this society, and we'll show you where the uh, the use and abuse originally comes from. Indeed. And again, the point being that tonight we're going to be concentrating on a very specific step-by-step -step path of the um, the growth of the heroin trade and the, the, the changeover of the heroin trade from something that was initially purely an, uh, um, an underworld movement, a criminal movement, solely for the purpose of, of uh, money-making and how it became a political tool. Um, again, heroin is only one of the drugs we're going to talk about, as Dave mentioned. We've got LSD coming up. We're going to talk about the cocaine trade. We're going to talk about a variety of other things in the upcoming shows. So if you're just tuning in for the first time, um, if it seems a little slow going to you, as Dave mentioned at the top of the broadcast, we realize that that's the reason that this show is formatted differently from the broadcast that we do on Sunday, which tend to be much more fast moving, which tend to touch on a variety of topics. These are archive broadcasts. They are meant to contain as much information as we can as we can squeeze into four hours without 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 killing ourselves, basically. Um, and still being able to make sense, which is important also. And, uh, and we tend to go very deeply into the source material we use, as again tonight with The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, and a very important book that probably most people out there have never read, and at least this will give them a good, healthy sampling of the work contained in it. Beyond that, the, the fact of the matter is that if the issues that we talk about on One Step Beyond that Mae Russell talks about on her World Watchers program, also heard on this station, if these issues are going to be dealt with effectively by our society, by the people in our society, Obviously, people are going to have to know about them, and yet people are up against uh, the, the limitation of all their, uh, the fact that there are only 168 hours in a week. People have to work, they have to go to school, they have family commitments, and so forth. Uh, that's really what our archive shows are aimed at doing, is to give you an in-depth, complete understanding, or as complete as one can get, and, and, and also give you hard references. In other words, we're not sitting here asking you to accept our word for things. We're giving you the relevant source material and exerting as much of it as we reasonably can on the tape, so that basically you can acquire a degree of expertise, and yet you won't have to rearrange your, your lifestyle fundamentally in order to do it. But again, these are very, very important topics that we cover this is uh, not only one of the most important topics, but it's extremely timely. Uh, for those who eventually hear these programs later, this program is being recorded in mid-October of 1986 amidst a, uh, a rising uh, wave of, of anti-drug hysteria in this country. Now, needless to say, neither Nip nor myself uh, advocates the use of illegal drugs. That's a decision people should make uh, on their own, and I think make it very carefully, and uh, the dominant consideration should be their own health. However, the fact of the matter is that a lot of these drugs, and friend, as damaging as they are, come from elements of our government, that our government is inextricably linked with the very plague that it is now ostensibly leading the charge against. And it, it, uh, it, it's extremely timely, and again, as, as Nip indicated, the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia is not readily available. It's one of the one of the d dominant uh, reference works in this field, and it's not easy to get a hold of. We're going to be exerting long seg segments of it tonight, many of the key segments. So uh, again, feast feast your eyes and brains, and uh, and go for it. 
Now, as many of our listeners uh, who have been following these broadcasts before are aware, um, the the drug situation and the the stance of our government vis-a-vis drugs um, is very similar to our the stance of our government uh, vis-a-vis terrorism. Insofar as if we were going to make a, a, a psychiatric comparison, we would call it transference. Transference is when one sees in other people um, the very illnesses that one has oneself. Um, a classic case is what's been going on lately. Um, um, with uh, Nicaragua, where Nicaragua has been accused by the Reagan administration of being uh, uh, the chief supplier of cocaine in the Western Hemisphere, working with Cuba um, and the Soviet Union to flood our country with uh, with killer cocaine and destroy the moral foundation of our youth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, in fact, as those who follow the newspapers, and especially those who follow um, uh, these broadcasts, know, uh, in fact, the overwhelming weight of evidence is on the side uh, showing that the folks, in fact, who are dealing cocaine in the Nicaraguan conflict are the Contras, which, again, is not surprising because, as we will see tonight, um, the right-wing mercenary slash intelligence milieu has been making use of illegal drugs as a source for ready capital for a long time, especially when connected with the, uh, the illegal arms traffic. And again, what we see in, in this case is we see the Reagan, administra- Reagan administration um, hysterically denouncing uh, communist drug traffickers um, while at the, and, and decrying the, uh, the rot of the moral fabric of our country due to drug use, while at the same time it's our very own intelligence establishment, as we will begin to show tonight, that has been for the last 40 years dealing very extensively in illegal drugs themselves. Um, and in fact, that they have been doing this far more than, as far as we can tell, any of the communist countries um, or otherwise uh, uh, anathematic countries um, that are constantly cited by our government as examples of governments gone bad or terrorist or drug dealing governments. So again, we're going to see tonight where this springs directly out of a very, very old program um, that started in Asia at the time of the Chinese Revolution, um, actually before the Chinese Revolution during World War II, um, and has carried on right to this day, this program of using Drugs, and this is the main thing here tonight, using drugs not necessarily because of any moral commitment to, to drugs or because of anything uh, about drugs other than the fact that they move quickly, they reap a great deal of profit for a small amount of, uh, of actual material moved, um, that the circles that tend to deal in drugs are already dr- dealing in a lot of other things like arms and things of that nature, and in many cases also in political insurrection. Uh, and the fact that they are a very, very good under-the-table source of capital for operations that people like the CIA cannot have bankrolled in the public eye. It's also worth noting, too, a couple of points. Uh, By introducing uh, illegal drugs into a given environment, you are creating a conspiratorial milieu in and of itself because they are illegal. That uh, often serves as an ideal vehicle for compromising people and subsequently using those people for uh, whatever purposes an intelligence service would like to. Beyond that, it should be noted also, in addition to the situation in Nicaragua, the Afghan freedom fighters who are receiving the largest support of any uh, group from our intelligence system at the moment is also very much involved in the narcotics traffic. They have been linked both to large-scale hashish and opium trafficking, and uh, the profits from these are going to finance their war. As we're going to see this evening and in uh, future Radio Free America shows on the subject, that is a very, very common, almost numbingly, uh, familiar pattern, because and we're, and we're going to be looking at that at in, in, uh, great length this evening in Southeast Asia, both before and during the American involvement in the Vietnam War. And undoubtedly, an upcoming broadcast we will be mentioning, as Dave said, it's a numbingly familiar pattern. It's not only with many, many Southeastern, Southeast Asian governments, such as the uh, the Laotian and the Vietnamese and, uh, uh, and the Chinese, uh, well, the Taiwanese governments and, and people of this sort. We've also seen it time and time again in the Middle East with the phalanges that we have been supporting in the Middle East, the phalanges government there the right-wing government of Turkey, um, uh, in Italy, in certain certain political groups that we've supported, in France, in Spain, and all over South and Central America. Uh, in short, it's virtually a worldwide phenomenon, and in, in nine out of ten cases, it seems there has been direct intervention uh, by our intelligence service at some point along the route. So stick with us, folks. It's going to be a rather uh, a chilling ride, and there's going to be a lot of ups and even more downs, but it's something that if you are concerned about drugs, and this can mean as a parent, as a uh, as a person themselves who has taken or been exposed to drugs, um, or just as a concerned citizen who's been hearing all the talk on the on the news, um, if you're concerned about drugs, you owe it to yourself to to pull your head out of the sand and to find out what's really going on with the politics of drugs and international intelligence. Now, before we actually get into the history of 
or the, the historical background to our intelligence services involvement with the narcotics traffic, we're going to just, by way of introduction, uh, discuss ever so briefly a little bit about the history of heroin, which is the first of the drugs we're going to be considering. Now, it should be noted that uh, it's intriguing that heroin should have become such a scourge in our society because initially heroin, heroin was not only a legal drug, but it specifically was hailed as a miracle drug. It was hailed as a cough suppressant. It was hailed, ironically enough, as a cure for morphine addiction, believe it or not, in its inception. And it, uh, the, the actual drug, heroin itself, was, it was widely regarded. It was initially developed by the Bayer Company, one of the member companies of IG Farben, which we're going to talk about. But when it was, hey, when it first came out, and uh, it, I believe, was first developed in 1898, it was literally the subject of a worldwide media advertising blitz by the Bayer Company, and doctors were prescribing it right and left for all kinds of ailments. By the early 20s, it had become apparent that this had created a monstrous addiction problem in the United States and elsewhere, so the drug became illegal at that point. But it should be noted that America's drug addicts, America's heroin addicts, initially became addicted to that drug because it was not only legal, but widely prescribed by the medical community. That's uh, something to think about as uh, you observe a lot of uh, people today becoming addicted to prescription drugs. Perhaps they've had surgery or been injured and a doctor will prescribe a painkiller and that painkiller can prove addictive. This again is a numbingly familiar pattern. Heroin initially, and this is this is a significant point, was not only legal but was hailed as a miracle drug and widely prescribed. And this is where the addiction problem for the heroin addiction problem first comes from. It should be noted that the problem of heroin addiction was added to morphine addiction and compounded the problem of morphine addiction. And it's worth noting for our purposes that morphine addiction uh, has stemmed largely in this country from wars. Specifically, casualties were treated with morphine in order to dull their pain. Many of the men, and this is the first large-scale morphine addiction in this country, followed the Civil War. And it's, it's worth noting that after our major foreign wars, there has always been an upsurge in uh, drug addiction in this country due to people who are treated with morphine and, or other drugs and become addicted to it. There was a large swelling of the addict population in the United States immediately after World War I due to the effects of morphine. And then shortly after World War I, uh, the medical community in this country took stock of the fact that heroin was creating a huge addiction problem. And then finally, after being hailed as a miracle drug and widely prescribed, it became illegal. And uh, Nip's going to give you a couple of interesting details about heroin's origin and about uh, the origin of a drug which is used now to treat heroin addiction. And as you listen to what he's reading, remember that initially heroin was prescribed for, among other things, a cure. It was prescribed as a cure for morphine addiction. This short segment I'm going to read is from a book called The Crime and Punishment of I.G. IG Farben. Uh, the book is by Joseph Borkin, B-O-R-K-I-N, copyright 1978, by the Free Press, which is a, of, a division of Macmillan, a division of McMission, a division of Macmillan Publishing Company. Um, an excellent book, by the way, and well worth uh, your time. It gives a, a very good insight into something that people who are students of history and politics and warfare often do not spend enough time with, which is the economic and industrial basis of war, which is uh, inextricable from the, the fabric of warfare itself. Uh, just before Nip reads, the I.G. Farben, for people who are tuned into us for perhaps for the first time or one of the first times, I.G. Farben, or the Interessen Gemeinschaft Farben Industry, as its full name is, is uh, something, it's one of the dominant industrial concerns in the world, and it's something one should really, it's sort of a must to know about if you want to understand the history of uh, industry in, in uh, the modern world. Uh, it basically was a, was a giant chemical cartel, a number of companies that uh, had comprised the, the uh, heart of the German dye stuff industry, combined after World War I into one giant cartel, or Interessen Gemeinschaft, a, which roughly translates community of interest. This uh, giant chemical cartel, the IG Farben industry, composed of a number of different companies, including the Bayer Company, which Nip is going to read you about, uh, remained the, as a cartel through the end of World War II, and during the World War II and pre-World War II period, the IG Farben pr provided the backbone of Hitler's war production. It was the single dominant industrial concern in Nazi Germany, and as one uh, observer of the situation noted, he said that Hitler was Farben and Farben was Hitler. After the war, the company was the cartel was broken up into its member companies, but those member companies remained just as influential on the scene as they were when they were uh, one giant company. It's sort of similar to the way Standard Oil, where the old Standard Oil Trust was busted up into Mobil, Exxon, Chevron, and other companies, but it's still they're still all owned by the Rockefellers. So in a sense, the 
trust busting under Roosevelt was sort of academic. But the IG Farben, a giant chemical cartel, the single most important concern behind the Third Reich. Also, it should be mentioned that at the end of World War II, uh, several members of the IG Farben Board of Directors were the first civilians ever found guilty of war crimes, which should give you an idea of how very closely the community of interest was shared between IG Farben and Hitler's Nazi uh, political machine. And listeners listening to the, these tapes in the future, if they would like re to refer to things dealing with IG Farben, at DAVCOR we have a number of different tapes. First of all, Uncle Sam and the Swastika deals extensively with IG Farben. Our first two Radio Free America shows, looking back from 1984, The Hidden History of the Cold War, Parts 1 and 2, deal with IG Farben at considerable length throughout the broadcast. And also a program called The Third Reich, South Africa and the Bomb deals with the role of, the, of IG Farben in, in Nazi Germany's industrial production and also in the, uh, the nuclear production of post-war Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany. So people would like to read up more on IG, there are some good references. Now, after all that build-up, it's a very short segment, but it's a very interesting segment nonetheless. Remember, Bayer was part of this, this uh, interlocking concern, chemical concern, IG Farben. Bayer's pharmaceutical venture was even larger. Out of its laboratories emerged aspirin, the world's most famous home remedy for pain and fever. Bayer was also responsible for the introduction of heroin, which it sold as a cure for morphine addiction and as a cough suppressant, especially effective in children. Later, the Bayer Laboratories developed methadone in preparation for World War II as a synthetic substitute for morphine. It was originally named Dolophine in honor of Adolf Hitler. Today, methadone is used principally in the treatment of heroin addiction. And, of course, uh, methadone itself is highly addictive, but uh, 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 actually it's used for one reason, because it's safer and it's, it's cheaper to manufacture than, it, than heroin is. But it's interesting, again, that uh, heroin addiction, initially, of course, heroin prescribed as a cure for morphine addiction, uh, is now being cured by methadone, which was initially a synthetic narcotic produced by IG Farben uh, in case the flow of opium from the east was cut off by the British blockade during World War II, and, of course, originally named in honor of Adolf Hitler. Well, now, we're going to begin dealing with the actual influence of the U.S. intelligence system on the narcotics traffic and its actual involvement in that narcotics traffic. Perhaps the most significant piece of background, uh, of historical background, to understand the involvement of our intelligence services in narcotics trafficking is to understand three wartime alliances made by the U.S. intelligence system, and or World War II and immediate post-World War II alliances. Specifically, these alliances were with criminal syndicates, which had considerable links to the narcotics trafficking. The first link we're going to look at is an alliance between U.S. naval intelligence and the Honorata Societa, or Mafia, as it's commonly known, the Sicilian Mafia. Following that, we're going to take a look at the involvement of the CIA with the Union Course, the Corsican syndicate in France immediately after World War II. And later on in the broadcast, we're going to take a look at the involvement of U.S. naval intelligence and the OSS, America's wartime World War II intelligence service, with uh, a fellow named Tai Lee. He was a uh, a, an imperial, not imperial Japanese, he was a, actually an imperial Chinese if you want to look at it that way. He was a Kuomintang warlord and the chief in, the intelligence chief and uh, political enforcer, I guess you could say, for Chiang Kai-shek prior to his uh, overthrow by the Chinese communists in 1949. Tai Li was also very much involved with the narcotics trafficking through the, the Green Gang in Shanghai, as we're going to look at. He formed a very, very interesting alliance with naval intelligence. These three alliances between the U.S. intelligence system and criminal syndicates during and immediately after World War II are inextricably, are, are essential for understanding the involvement of the U.S. intelligence system with narcotics trafficking. Again, the first of these alliances we're going to be looking at is the U.S. Navy's wartime alliance with the Mafia. Reading now from The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred W. McCoy. The book was pop, cop, copyrighted in 1972, published in hardcover by Harper and Row. Once again, Alfred McCoy's The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, also assisted by Kathleen B. Reed and Leonard P. Adams. Now, it's worth noting that at the point in the story which we're going to be uh, picking up, well, actually, we're going to look at uh, the first thing I'm going to read here is a little bit of the overview for the U.S. intelligence system's involvement with, an with, with uh, organized crime and its involvement, subsequent involvement with the narcotics trafficking. Then we're going to get into the whole question of the... Uh, the CIA and OSS involvement with the Mafia in great detail in just a second. It's worth noting, though, that during World War II, the, heroin, the number of heroin addicts in this country dropped enormously because uh, basically World War II seriously disrupted the international narcotics traffic. 
uh, combination of the fact that the sea lanes were much more perilous due, to, obviously, to the submarine warfare and so forth, the fact that, as a result, merchant shipping bottoms were not as easy to come by, the increased security countries had around their borders, a lot of different factors combined to make to, to make it extremely difficult to traffic in heroin internationally. Also, uh, the progress of the warfare itself also disrupted the international heroin trade considerably, as, uh, as different, p- different uh, groups involved in the narcotics trade were forced to uh, migrate or to, to move very suddenly due to the progress of the warfare. But it's worth noting that, dur- that during World War II, Heroin, the heroin supply, the World Heroin Distribution Network was almost decimated, and the number of heroin addicts in the United States reduced to almost nothing. Because had the situation turned out differently, had the U.S. intelligence system not involved itself with these criminal syndicates, it's quite possible that the world heroin problem could have been eliminated at the end of World War II. Reading once again now, or returning to, I should say, The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. While law enforcement efforts failed to stem the flow of illicit heroin into the United States during the 1930s, the outbreak of World War II seriously disrupted international drug traffic. Wartime border security measures and a shortage of ordinary commercial shipping made it nearly impossible for traffickers to smuggle heroin into the United States. Distributors augmented dwindling supplies by cutting, adulterating heroin with increasingly greater proportions of sugar or quinine. While most packets of heroin sold in the United States were 28% pure in 1938, only three years later they were less than 3% pure. As a result of all this, many American addicts were forced to undergo involuntary withdrawal from their habits, and by the end of World War II, the American addict population had dropped to less than 20,000. In fact, as the war drew to a close, there was every reason to believe that the scourge of heroin had finally been purged from the United States. Heroin supplies were non-existent, international criminal syndicates were in disarray, and the addict population was reduced to manageable proportions for the first time in half a century. But the disappearance of heroin addiction from the American scene was not to be. Within several years, in large part thanks, in large part, thanks to the nature of U.S. foreign policy after World War II, the drug syndicates were back in business, the poppy fields in Southeast Asia started to expand, and heroin refineries multiplied both in Marseille and Hong Kong. How did we come to inflict this heroin plague on ourselves? The answer lies in the history of America's Cold War crusade. World War II shattered the world order much of the globe had known for almost a century. Advancing and retreating armies surged across the face of three continents, leaving in their wake a legacy of crumbling empires, devastated national economies, and shattered social orders. In Europe, the defeat of fascist regimes in Germany, Italy, France, and Eastern Europe released workers from years of police state repression. A wave of grassroots militants swept through European labor movements and trade unions launched a series of spectacular strikes to achieve their economic and political goals. Bled white by six years of costly warfare, both the victor and vanquished nations of Europe lacked the means and the will to hold on to their Asian colonial empires. Within a few years after the end of World War II, vigorous national liberation movements swept through Asia from India to Indonesia as indigenous groups rose up against their colonial masters. America's nascent Cold War crusaders viewed these events with undisguised horror. Conservative Republican and Democratic leaders alike felt that the United States should be rewarded for its wartime sacrifices. These men wanted to inherit the world as it had been and had little interest in seeing it changed. Henry Luce, founder of the Time Life Empire, argued that America was the rightful heir to Great Britain's international primacy and heralded the post-war era as, quote, the American century, unquote. To justify their entanglement in foreign adventures, America's cold warriors embraced a militantly anti-communist ideology. In their minds, the entire world was locked in a Manichaean struggle between godless communism and the free world, unquote. The Soviet Union was determined to conquer the world, and its leader Joseph Stalin was the new Hitler. European labor movements and Asian nationalist struggles were pawns of international communism, unquote, and as such had to be subverted or destroyed. There could be no compromise with this monolithic evil. Negotiations were appeasement, unquote, and neutralism was immoral, unquote. In this desperate struggle to save Western civilization, unquote, any ally was more welcome and any means was justified. The military dictatorship on, ta- on Taiwan became free China, unquote. The police state in South Vietnam was free Vietnam, unquote. A collection of military dictatorships stretching from Pakistan to Argentina was the free world, unquote. 
the CIA became the vanguard of America's anti-communist crusade, and it dispatched small numbers of well-financed agents to every corner of the globe to mold local political situations in a fashion compatible with American interests. Practicing a ruthless form of clandestine realpolitik, its agents made alliances with any local group willing and able to stem the flow of communist aggression, unquote. Although these alliances represent only a small fraction of CIA post-war operations, they have nevertheless had a profound impact on the international heroin trade. The Cold War was waged, in, was waged in many parts of the world, but Europe was the most important battleground in the 1940s and 50s. Determined to restrict Soviet influence in Western Europe, American clandestine operatives intervened in the internal politics of Germany, Italy, and France. In Sicily, the forerunner of the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services, formed an alliance with the Sicilian Mafia to limit the political gains of the Italian Communist Party on this impoverished island. In France, the Mediterranean port city of Marseille became a major battleground between the CIA and the French Communist Party during the late 1940s. To tip the balance of power in its favor, the CIA recruited Corsican gangsters to battle communist strikers and backed leading figures in the city's Corsican underworld who were at odds with the local communists. Ironically, both the Sicilian Mafia and the Corsican underworld played a key role in the gro growth of Europe's post-war heroin traffic and were to provide most of the heroin smuggled into the United States for the next two decades. That's by way of introduction, and now, as indicated, Nip's going to uh, begin reading you specifically about the OSS Naval Intelligence Mafia Alliance during and after World War II. All right. This is also from Albert Mc Alfred McCoy's Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. This is headed, The Mafia Restored, Fighters for Democracy in World War II. World War II gave the Mafia a new lease on life. In the United States, the Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, became increasingly concerned over a series of sabotages and incidents on the New York waterfront, which culminated with the burning of the French liner Normandie on the eve of its christening as an Allied troop ship. Powerless to infiltrate the waterfront itself, the ONI very practically decided to fight fire with fire and contacted Joseph Lanza, mafia boss of the East Side Docks, who agreed to organize effective anti-sabotage surveillance throughout his waterfront territory. When ONI decided to expand Operation Underworld to the West Side Docks in 1943, they discovered they would have to deal with the man who controlled them, Lucky Luciano, unhappily languishing in the harsh Dannemora prison. After he promised full cooperation to naval intelligence officers, Luciano was rewarded by being transferred to a less austere state penitentiary near Albany, where he was regularly visited by military officers and underworld leaders such as Meyer Lansky, who had emerged as Luciano's chief assistant. While ONI enabled Luciano to resume active leadership of American organized crime, the Allied invasion of Italy returned the Sicilian Mafia to power. On the night of July 9, 1943, 160,000 Allied troops landed on the extreme southwestern shore of Sicily. After securing a beachhead, General George Patton's U.S. 7th Army launched an offensive into the island's western hills, Italy's Mafia land, and headed for the city of Palermo. Although there were over 60,000 Italian troops and 100 miles of booby-trapped roads between Patton and Palermo, his troops covered the distance in a remarkable four days. The Defense Department has never offered any explanation for the remarkable lack of resistance in Patton's race through western Sicily, and pointedly refused to pri provide any information to Senator Estes Kefauver's Organized Crime Subcommittee in 1951. However, Italian experts on the Sicilian Mafia have never been so reticent. Five days after the Allies landed in Sicily, an American fighter plane flew over the village of Villalba, about 45, 45 miles north of General Patton's beachhead on the road to Palermo, and jettisoned a canvas sack addressed to Zucalo. Zucalo, better known as Don Calogero Vizzini, was the unchallenged leader of the Sicilian Mafia and Lord of the Mountain region through which the American army would be passing. The sack contained a yellow silk scarf emblazoned with a large black L. The L, of course, stood for Lucky Luciano, and silk scarves were a common form of identification used by mafiosi traveling from Sicily to America. It was hardly surprising that Lucky Luciano should be communicating with Don Calogero under such circumstances. Luciano had been born less than 15 miles from Villalba in Lercara Fridi, where his mafiosi relatives still worked for Don Calogero. Two days later, three American tanks rolled into Villalba after driving 30 miles through enemy territory. 
Don Calogero climbed aboard and spent the next six days traveling through western Sicily, organizing support for the advancing American troops. As General Patton's 3rd Division moved onward into Don Calogero's mountain domain, the signs of its dependence on Mafia support were obvious to the local population. The Mafia protected the roads from snipers, arranged enthusiastic welcomes for the advancing troops, and provided guides through the confusing mountain terrain. While the role of the Mafia is little more than a historical footnote to the Allied conquest of Sicily, its cooperation with the American military occupation, otherwise known as AMGOT, was extremely important. Although there is room for speculation about Luciano's precise role in the invasion, there can be little doubt about the relationship between the Mafia and the American military occupation. This alliance developed when, in the summer of 1943, the Allied occupation's primary concern was to release as many of their troops as possible from garrison duties on the island so they could be used in the offensive throughout southern Italy. Practicality was the order of the day, and in October, the Pentagon advised occupation officers, quote, that the Carabinieri, an Italian army, will be found satisfactory for local security purposes, unquote. But the fascist army had long since deserted, and Don Calogero's mafia seemed far more reliable at guaranteeing public order than Mussolini's powerless Carabinieri. So in July, the Civil Affairs Control Office of the U.S. Army appointed Don Calogero mayor of Villalba. In addition, AMGOT appointed loyal mafiosi as mayors in many of the towns and villages in western Sicily. As Allied forces crawled north through the Italian mainland, American intelligence officers became increasingly upset about the leftward drift of Italian politics. Between late 1943 and mid-1944, the Italian Communist Party's membership had doubled, and in the German-occupied northern half of the country, an extremely radical resistance movement was gathering strength. In the winter of 1944, over 500,000 Turin workers shut the factories for eight days, despite brutal Gestapo repression, and the Italian underground grew to almost 150,000 armed men. Rather than being heartened by the underground's growing strength, the U.S. Army became increasingly concerned about its radical politics and began to cut back its arms drops to the resistance in mid-1944. Quote, More than 20 years ago, Allied military commanders reported in 1944, a similar situation provoked the march on Rome and gave birth to fascism. We must make up our minds, and that quickly, whether we want this second march developing into another ism. Unquote. In Sicily, the decision had already been made. To combat expected communist gains, occupation authorities used mafia officials in the AMGOT administration. Since any changes in the island's feudal social structure would cost the Mafia money and power, the, quote, honored society was a natural anti-communist ally. So confident was Don Calogero of his importance to Amgot that he killed Villalba's overly inquisitive police chief to free himself of all restraints. In Naples, one of Luciano's lieutenants, Vito Genovese, was appointed to a position of interpreter liaison officer in American Army headquarters and quickly became one of Amgot's most trusted employees. It was a remarkable turnabout. Less than a year before, Genovese had arranged the mur murder of Carlo Fresca, editor of an anti-fascist Italian language newspaper in New York, to please the Mussolini government. Genovese and Don Calogero were old friends, and they used their official positions to establish one of the largest black market operations in all of southern Italy. Don Calogero sent enormous truck caravans loaded with all the basic food commodities necessary for the Italian diet rolling northward to Hungary, Naples where their cargoes were distributed by Genovese's organization. All the trucks were issued passes and export papers by the AMGOT administration in Naples, in Sicily. And some corrupt American army officers even made contributions of gasoline and trucks to the operation. In exchange for these favors, Don Calogero became one of the major supporters of the Sicilian independence movement, which was enjoying the covert support of the OSS. As Italy veered to the left in 43 of 44, the American military became alarmed about their future position in, the Mediterranean, in, in Italy and felt that the island's naval bases and strategic location in the Mediterranean might provide a possible future counterbalance to a communist mainland. Don Calogero supported this separatist movement by recruiting most of Sic Western Sicily's mountain bandits for its volunteer army, but quietly abandoned it shortly after the OSS dropped it in 1945. Don Calogero rendered other services to the anti-communist effort by breaking up leftist political rallies. 
On September 16, 1944, for example, the communist leader Girolamo Licausi held a rally in Villalba that ended ar- abruptly in a hail of gunfire as Don Calaguero's men fired into the crowd and wounded 19 spectators. Michele Pantaleone, who observed the Mafia's revival in his native village of Villalba, described the consequences of AMGOT's occupation policies. Quote, By the beginning of the Second World War, the Mafia was restricted to a few isolated and scattered groups and could have been completely wiped out if the social problems of the island had been dealt with. The Allied occupation and the subsequent slow restoration of democracy reinstated the Mafia with its full powers, put it once more on the way to becoming a political force, and returned to the Honorata Societa, the weapons which fascism had snatched from it. So, before we continue, let's just point out a couple of very key and important things that have already happened. First of all, the American uh, military establishment has already put itself into debt with Lucky Luciano and the Sicilian Mafia. Um, in other words, if we were going to be dramatic about this, or if this were a fairy tale, what they have done here is they have signed uh, the pact with the devil. They have sold their soul to the Mafia. Secondarily, the American military has begun to put mafiosi in positions of power um, in local villages, and uh, remember the mafiosa already had a very strong internal structure. So to put them in a position of power was to make sure that very quickly the mafiosi were going to be completely in power. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly for what we're discussing tonight, um, the pattern that we have looked at time and time again on all of these Radio Free America broadcasts um, at the end of World War II uh, shows up, which is the actual resistance, the people who have been fighting uh, to free their country from uh, the fascists in Italy and also the Nazis as well, um, as happened in Greece, as happened in Vietnam, as happened in many, many other places all over the world. Um, the, the actual resistance, because the fact that most of the effective resistance came from leftist movements who were well organized, the actual resistance was uh, betrayed by the Western uh, occupiers. And in this case, as you can see, as the resistance began to build up strength, they began stopping um, the arms drops, cutting them back to prevent them from maintaining power and instead handed power over the mafia. This is a very, very uh, extremely uh, common thing, and we've seen this happen time and time again. And what it is, again, was the uh, effort on the part of the American intelligence and military establishments to shape the post-war world and to keep the leftists out of power whenever possible. Unfortunately, in most of these countries, um, most of the legitimate uh, uh, middle-of-the-road opposition had been destroyed by the fascist governments. Um, The the leftists were anybody who even slightly socialist was too far left for these people in most cases. And so as a result, the people who got the power were in most cases the same fascists who had been cooperating avidly with the Nazis or the Italians or the Japanese. Right. So again, for the purposes of the discussion here, the uh, sabotage that was uh, in effect, the, the, the acts of sabotage on the East Coast docks during World War II leads U.S. naval intelligence to make a deal with the, Itali- the, the American mafia to basically use their influence on the docks to eliminate this sabotage. That deal then basically results in the lightening of the sentence of Lucky Luciano, the head of the American Mafia. Luciano, in exchange for his support in helping to eliminate acts of sabotage, is guaranteed freedom after the war. He gets that freedom, and along with many other American mafiosi, is installed in a position of power in Italy. Some American Mafia leaders went to Italy and were installed in power, such as Vito Genovese under Amgot. Some of them, such as Don Caligaro, were there to begin with. But the point is that it was the American involvement in Sicily, which restored the Sicilian Mafia to power, that Sicilian Mafia, under the at, the, at the point that we're about to resume the discussion, the then deported Lucky Luciano, is one of the dominant elements in restoring the heroin trade, the world heroin trade. Recall that heroin and illicit drug traffic in general was almost brought to a halt by World War II. The Mafia in, in Italy and Sicily, because Mussolini looked on them as a rival power base, was virtually eliminated. The U.S., via its uh, w- wartime and post-war alliances, installs the Mafia in Sicily. And as indicated here, the Mafia then uh, duly set about machine-gunning various communists and leftists that their American sponsors wanted gotten rid of. And as we'll see, despite the fact that, as Dave mentioned, uh, Mussolini decided to to move his Mafia rivals out of the way during World War II, at the end of World War II, finding themselves both in many cases on the receiving end of, uh, of uh, OSS and CIA aid money and secret loans and things like that, uh, the Mafia and the fascists began growing 
coming back together uh, to to cooperate in fighting the quote unquote communist threat on behalf of their Western intelligence masters. By the way, this uh, fascist mafia axis and in its involvement in drug drug trafficking is something we've all already looked at in our Mediterranean merry-go-round series about the Pope shooting, specifically in Radio Free America number 20, our program dealing with the Stebom Arms for Drugs ring. We looked at the P2, the Italian fascists involvement with an arms for drug smuggling ring. We'll be touching back on Stebom later in this series. Returning once again to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. Now recall, the Sicilian Mafia and Italian Mafia, virtually eliminated by Mussolini, are now back in power stronger than ever due to the influence of the American armies which had landed there and put them back in power as part of a military government and used their uh, assassination and violence expertise to help suppress communism in Italy. It should be also noted, by the way, before we get into Lucky Luciano and his actual role in reorganizing the heroin traffic after World War II, that the very resistance of uh, the communist and socialist groups in Europe to the fascists was one of the things that had made them so pow so uh, powerful. They were both very popular because the virtually the only militarily significant resistance in Europe did come from the various communist parties. That, in turn, made them very popular with the populations of the countries that had been occupied by the German and Italian armies. So it's sort of an ironic situation. Uh, this was why the perceived communist threat existed, precisely because they, the communists were the only ones who stood up to the fascists on the con in, in the occupied nations for all practical purposes. So again, the American military government using the uh, mafia both to help get to help secure the East Coast docks and to help get them into Sicily when it was occupied by the Italian fascists and to help them put down the perceived communist threat after the war, the, the Sicilian mafia is back in power stronger than ever. It's at this point in 1946 when Lucky Luciano gets deported to Sicily after being freed as per his, per his agreement with naval intelligence. This is where we're going to resume our uh, narrative here. Again, going back to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. In 1946... American military intelligence made one final gift to the Mafia. They released Luciano from prison and deported him to Italy, thereby freeing the greatest criminal talent of his generation to rebuild the heroin trade. Appealing to the New York State Parole Board in 1945 for his immediate release, Luciano's lawyers based their case on his wartime services to the Navy and Army. Although Navy and Naval intelligence officers called to give evidence that the hearings were extremely vague about what they had promised Luciano in exchange for his services, one naval officer wrote a number of confidential letters on Luciano's behalf that were instrumental in securing his release. Within two years after Luciano returned to Italy, the U.S. government deported over 100 more mafiosi as well. And with the cooperation of his old friend Don Calagero and with the help of many of his old followers from New York, Luciano was able to build an awesome international narcotics syndicate soon after his arrival in Italy. The narcotic syndicate Luciano organized after World War II remains one of the most remarkable in the history of the traffic. For more than a decade, it moved morphine based from the Middle East to Europe, transformed it into heroin, and then exported it in substantial quantities to the United States, all without ever suffering a major arrest or seizure. The organization's comprehensive distribution network within the United States increased the number of active addicts from an estimated 20,000 at the close of World War II to 60,000 in 1952 and to 150,000 by 1965. After resurrecting the narcotics traffic, Luciano's first problem was securing a reliable supply of heroin. Initially, he relied on diverting legally produced heroin from an, one of Italy's most respected pharmaceutical companies, Schiaparelli. However, investigations by the U.S. Federal Bureau, Bureau of Narcotics in 1950, which disclosed that a minimum of 700 kilos of heroin had been diverted to Luciano over a four-year period, led to a tightening of Italian pharmaceutical regulations. But by this time, Luciano had built up a network of clandestine laboratories in Sicily and Marseille and no longer needed to divert the Schiaparelli product. Morphine base was now the necessary commodity. Thanks to his contacts in the Middle East, Luciano established a long-term business relationship with a Lebanese who was quickly becoming known as the Middle East's major exporter of morphine base, Sami El Khoury, E-L-K-H-O-U-R-Y. Through ju judicious use of bribes and his high social standing in Beirut society, El Khoury established an organization of unparalleled political strength. The directors of Beirut Airport, Lebanese Customs, the Lebanese Narcotics Police, and perhaps most importantly, the chief of the anti-subversive section of the Lebanese police, protected the import of raw opium from Turkey's Anatolian Plateau into Lebanon, its processing into morphine base, 
and its final export to the laboratories in Sicily and Marseille. After the morphine left Lebanon, its first step was the bod the bays and inlets of Sicily's western coast. There, Palermo's fishing trawlers would meet ocean-going freighters from the Middle East and international waters, pick up the drug cargo, and then smuggle it into fishing villages scattered along the rugged coastline. Once the morphine base was safely ashore, it was transformed into heroin into one of Luciano's clandestine laboratories. Typical of these was the candy factory opened in Palermo in 1949. It was leased to one of Luciano's cousins and managed by Don Calagero himself. The laboratory operated without incident until April 11th, 1954, when the Roman daily Avanti published a photograph of the factory under the headline, Textiles and Sweets on the Drug Route, unquote. That evening, the factory was closed and the laboratory's chemists were reportedly smuggled out of the country. Once heroin had been manufactured and packaged for export, Luciano used his mafia connections to send it through a maze of international routes to the United States. Not all of the mafiosi deported from the United States stayed in Sicily. To reduce the chance of seizure, Luciano had placed many of them in such European cities as Milan, Hamburg, Paris, and Marseille, so they could forward the heroin to the United States after it arrived from Sicily concealed in fruits, vegetables, or candy. From Europe, heroin was shipped directly to New York or smuggled through Canada and Cuba. While Luciano's prestige and organizational genius were an invaluable asset and a large part of his success was due to his ability to... Let me start again. While Luciano's prestige and organizational genius were an invaluable asset, a large part of his success was due to his ability to pick reliable subordinates. After he was deported from the United States in 1946, he charged his longtime associate, Meyer Lansky, with the responsibility for managing his financial empire. Lansky also played a key role in organizing Luciano's heroin syndicate. He supervised smuggling operations, negotiated with Corsican heroin manufacturers, and managed the collection and concealment of the enormous profits. Lansky's control over the Caribbean and his relationship with the Florida-based Traficante family were of particular importance, since many of the heroin shipments passed through Cuba or Florida on their way to America's urban markets. For almost 20 years, the luciano lansky Traficante troika remained a major feature of the international heroin traffic. Continuing. Organized crime was welcome in pre-revolutionary Cuba, and Havana was probably the most important transit point for Luciano's European heroin shipments. The leaders of Luciano's heroin syndicate were at home in the Cuban capital and regarded it as a safe city. Lansky owned most of the city's casinos, and the Traficanti family served as Lansky's resident managers in Havana. Luciano's 1947 visit to Cuba laid the groundwork for Havana's subsequent role in international narcotic smuggling traffic. Arriving in January, Luciano summoned the leaders of American organized crime, including Meyer Lansky, to Havana for a meeting and began paying extravagant bribes to prominent Cuban officials as well. The director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics at the time felt that Luciano's presence in Cuba was an ominous sign. Quote, I had received a preliminary report through a Spanish-speaking agent I had sent to Havana, and I read this to the Cuban ambassador. The report stated that Luciano had already become friendly with a number of high Cuban officials through the lavish use of expensive gifts. Luciano had developed a full-fledged plan which envisioned the, Car the Caribbean as his center of operations. Cuba was to be made the center of all international narcotic operations, unquote pressure from the United States finally resulted in the revocation of Luciano's residence visa and his return to Italy, but not before he had received commitments from organized crime leaders in the United States to distribute the regular heroin shipments he promised them from Europe. The Caribbean, on the whole, was a happy place for American racketeers. Most governments were friendly and did not interfere with the business ventures that brought some badly needed capital into their generally poor countries. Organized crime had been well established in Havana long before Luciano's landmark voyage. During the 1930s, Meyer Lansky, quote, discovered the Caribbean for northeastern syndicate bosses and invested their illegal profits in an assortment of lucrative gambling ventures. In 1933, Lansky moved into the Miami Beach area and took over most of the illegal off-track betting and a variety of hotels and casinos. He was also reportedly responsible for organized crime's decision to declare Miami a, quote, free city. In other words, not subject to the usual rules of territorial monopoly. Following his success in Miami, Lansky moved to Havana for three years, and by the beginning of World War II, he owned the Hotel Nacional's casino and was leasing the municipal racetrack from a reputable New York bank. 
burdened by the enormous scope and diversity of his holdings, Lansky had to delegate much of the responsibility for daily management to local gangsters. One of the Lansky's earliest associates in Florida was Santo Traficante Sr., a Sicilian-born Tampa gangster. Traficante had earned his reputation as an effective organizer in the Tampa gambling rackets and was already a figure of some stature when Lansky first arrived in Florida. By the time Lansky returned to New York in 1940, Traficante had assumed responsibility for Lansky's interests in Havana and Miami. By the early 1950s, Traficante had himself become such an important figure that he in turn dele delegated his Havana concessions to Santo Traficante Jr., the most talented of his six sons. Santo Jr.'s official position in Havana was that of manager of the Sans Souci Casino. He was far more important than his title indicates. As his father's financial representative and ultimately Meyer Lansky's, Santo Jr. controlled much of Havana's tourist industry and became quite close to the pre-Castro dictator Fulgencio Batista. Moreover, it was reportedly his responsibility to receive the bulk shipments of heroin from Europe and forward them through Florida to New York and other major urban centers where their distribution was assisted by local mafia bosses. Uh, just to mention broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. So now we see another major change in the drug traffic, and as uh, as Lucky Luciano uh, begins to develop his stranglehold on the heroin traffic um, and uh, puts his assistant, Meyer Lansky, more and more in charge of American operations, uh, Meyer Lansky discovers the benefits of the Caribbean and of Miami. And, uh, of course, to this very day, Miami is, is, is probably the U.S. center for illegal drug traffic. Um, however, one of the main things that's changed is that Cuba is no longer the main stopping point in the Western Hemisphere for the illegal drugs coming in. And, of course, the reason for this was the uh, the revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power and drove Fulgencio Batista and his cronies out. And uh, because along with Batista and his cronies um, went the mafia, and especially Meyer Lansky and the Traficantes, and uh, also their grip on uh, the, the drug traffic and the gambling and all those things that had made Cuba such a paradise for the mafia. Again, the Traficante Meyer Lansky uh, access is something that's going to come back with a vengeance later on in this series that we're doing. We'll be looking at the Traficante group in particular much later in the program. Yeah, I think this would be a good time to do it. All right, we'll do that then. We're going to take a break for a few minutes and give you all a chance to get up and turn around because uh, right now we're going to be going on after this and beginning to talk about some very interesting things having to do with France, the Marseille connection, uh, the Corsican Mafia, otherwise known as the Union Corse, and a variety of other fascinating topics that some of you may not know about, and if so, uh, you owe it to yourself to stick with us. We'll be back in just a few moments, Dave and myself, and uh, we will have more of Radio Free America for you right here on KFJC. Although, as mentioned at the top of the broadcast, this is going to be a three and possibly a four-part series. And uh, don't worry, folks, if you have a, a favorite drug you want to know about, uh, we'll be getting to them. Give us time. But tonight we're talking about drugs, and we're quoting extensively um, from a uh, an, an unfortunately not very well-known book called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy, as well as a few other works. Um, but this is an excellent book, very hard to, to get a hold of. But it is, uh, as I said earlier in the broadcast, perhaps the seminal work um, in the field, it certainly got a lot of other people started on this stuff, and uh, it's a book that you deserve uh, you deserve for yourself if you bump into it to pick up a copy of it somewhere. It's well worth your time and trouble to have, and it's very hard to find. We've been talking so far about the uh, initial connections between originally the Office of Naval Intelligence and then the OSS and the American military with the Sicilian Mafia. Um, the fact that the Sicilian Mafia, which was almost wiped out by Mussolini, was brought back into a position of power first by cooperating uh, with the American military occupation of Sicily and then later on because the uh, American intelligence and military people found them to be uh, as they saw it a wholesome alternative to the indigenous uh, communist and leftist um, uh, freedom fighters um, who actually had been the resistance during the war uh, but the American uh, military did not find that to be a healthy thought that these people would be in power after the war so instead uh, wherever they went they put back in either the original fascist functionaries or the mafia um, then we talked about how after the war how Lucky Luciano uh, set his heroin network in motion um, that was for a, a span of some 10 years not only the by far the world's leading uh, heroin network 
but it also never su suffered a major arrest or a seizure, and uh, how the uh, heroin-using uh, populace in the United States jumped dramatically after World War II to a large extent because of the American military and intelligence establishment's cooperation with Luciano and the Sicilian Mafia. We also we got problems here. There we go. There we go. That's our problem. Uh, we also took a look at the uh, eventual establishment of Cuba as a major transshipment point for the. There we go. For the, as a major transshipment point uh, for the drugs from. Uh, as as it, we, we looked at the installation of Cuba as a major transshipment point of the Luciano drug network. Okay, the drugs were firstly left the Middle East. They were grown in Turkey, they departed from Lebanon, went to the western coast of Sicily, and eventually, as we're going to see, Marseille became the major refining point. We're going to get into that in just a minute. From there, they went to Cuba, and from Cuba, of course, to the United States. We're going to come back to Cuba, the lansky Traficante uh, axis in just uh, a little bit, well, actually, probably in a couple of programs, but Cuba and the Traficante group are going to come in uh, later on, in a come, come to figure in this scenario in a big, big way. The point here being that it was U.S. Naval Intelligence and the Military Intelligence Alliance with the Mafia, first of all, in Operation Underworlds to secure American docks from sabotage, and then by installing the 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 Italian the Sicilian Mafia in power in in Sicily after uh, after the uh, American invasion there. This was the factor which created the the. Well, the resurgence of the mafia in that part of the country, so in that part of the world. So the, this basically is what we're looking at here. The uh, the U.S. military intelligence reinstalls the mafia in Sicily. The mafia with Luciano then is is dominant as a dominant factor in restoring the drug traffic. Uh, why don't you just leave leave the tape alone over there, Nick? We're we're recording on this one right here because it's <laughs> I can't it's I can't think re and, it's rewound. Okay, it's okay. Can't, can't think and, and and monitor the tape at the same time. It's just my my brain ain't big enough. So once again, recapping here because uh, you have to forgive us, folks, but we are we have to maintain our engineering duties here while we're uh, being <laughs> scholars, and sometimes that's not easy to uh, to do. If you hear occasional bump in the text here, it's probably just because we're we're maintaining our equipment and monitoring tapes and so forth. Anyway, again. The Mafia restored in Sicily by the U.S. military, that restoration of the Mafia through Operation Underworld and their, their use as anti-communist cadres is, is an instrumental factor in restoring the, at that point, almost moribund world heroin trade. At this point now, U.S. intelligence is not directly involved with the trafficking of narcotics, but b b via their machinations in the world and, and via through a, a sort of a quid pro quo, whereby in exchange for their anti-communist expertise, the mafia was more or less left alone. We see the, the U.S. intelligence essentially creating the world conditions for a resurgence in the world heroin trade. We're going to take a look at a... Uh, at, at further efforts in that regard right now. And in addition to restoring the Sicilian Mafia, the CIA was immediately after World War II responsible for placing the Union Corps, the Corsican organized crime syndicate, into a similar situation with regard to the docks in Marseille. We're going to take a look at Marseille's development as a major heroin shipment, as a major heroin refining center, and its work in turn with the Luciano Lansky mob here in just a minute. Returning, returning again to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. Now, McCoy here is going to comment briefly on a situation which we touched on earlier, namely the fact that it was the spirited resistance given by the various communist groups in Europe to the fascists, which won them much of the popularity which they retain to a certain extent even to this day, in, in particular Italy and France. In France, as uh, McCoy points out here, the Communist Party represented for all intents and purposes the only effective resistance against the Nazis. McCoy comments on that in the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. The resistance in France itself was hopelessly divided between the communists and non-communists. Although wartime American propaganda films and post-war French cinema have projected an image of France as a nation in chains, with every other citizen a nighttime warrior, most Frenchmen collaborated with the Germans willingly enough and were indifferent, if not outright hostile, toward the resistance. In contrast, the Communist Party, with its strong anti-fascist ideology and disciplined cell structure, began resistance activities almost immediately and remained the only effective armed organization in France until the 1944 Allied landings in Normandy. Now, that's an important factor to uh, keep in mind here, that it was the Communist resistance which won them their popularity. Now, after the uh, the after VE Day, basically, and after the surrender of Nazi Germany, the following situation was in effect in France. France was extremely poor; it was uh, had suffered a great deal of damage during the war, and extreme austerity measures were in effect throughout the country. 
Marseille had a very large uh, communist element in its working class that were very well organized and they had been very active in the resistance in response to a number of different things, notably the raising of the tram fares, which made getting to work extremely difficult for a lot of the workers. There was a strike in uh, Marseille. Now, eventually, uh, the... The, re the response to the strike was the, with the, in response to the strike, I should say, the socialist government of Marseille hired a number of different gangsters from the Union Corps. That is an organized crime syndicate run from the island of Corsica, very similar to the Sicilian Mafia in function, although it's organized very differently. The Corsican syndicate, the Union Corps, was instrumental in beating up a number of different communists in, in the city of Marseille, including several uh, legislators, several members of the city council who belonged to the Communist Party. In response to the Union Corps' or the Corsican syndicate's beating of the, the city council members who were communists, the communists organized a huge general strike in Marseille, which quickly spread to the rest of France. So the strike that you're going to hear Nip referring to here was a huge universe, a, a general strike in effect in France. It began in Marseille and spread to the rest of the country. And bear in mind that uh, this was spurred by very, very difficult conditions. Uh, the, the conditions for workers in France at this time were extremely poor. And the, the incident in Marseille, which was one of the best organized cities from the communist standpoint, was more or less the, uh, the, the match to the, the uh, tinderbox of, tinder of France at the time. You're also going to hear uh, the name the Guerinis mentioned, G-U-E-R-I-N-I, -I, the Guerinis. In this case, Antoine and Barthélemy Guerini um, were two Corsican uh, brothers who ran uh, one of the Union, Union Corps gangs and they had fired on some strikers and in fact uh, one of this one of the uh, the demonstrators was killed because of this action this led to a an increase of tension good point it was the greenies too who beat up the communist city council members too and, and uh, that was another of the major elements leading to the demonstrations which were fired on so uh, the greeny brothers are front and center here and they will be instrumental in the scenario which follows now this particular strike as a matter of fact that we're going to be reading about right now was called when the greenies were arrested for the shooting and then uh, four days after they were arrested the police mysteriously dropped all the charges and they were allowed to go free. Um, and the local label, labor confederation decided that this was too much and called the general strike. Again, reading from uh, Politics of Heroin. The strike was universal throughout France. Marseille workers had reached the breaking point at about the same time as their comrades in the rest of France. Spontaneous wildcat strikes erupted in factories, mines, and railway yards throughout the country. As militant workers took to the streets, demonstrating for fair wages and lower prices, the Communist Party leadership was reluctantly forced to take action. By the way, for those of you not familiar, a wildcat strike is, is a strike that has not been organized from the top down. It's a strike that occurs on a, at a local level or at a site or at a plant. So what they're saying here is that the Communist Party leadership actually followed the strike rather than leading the strike. Um, the Communist Party leadership was reluctantly forced to take action. On November 14th, the day after Marseille's unions went on strike, the leftist labor confederation, CGT, called for a nationwide general strike. Contrary to what one might expect, French communist leaders of this era were hardly wild-eyed revolutionaries. For the most part, they were conservative, middle-aged men who had served their nation well during the wartime resistance and now wanted, above all else, to take part in the governance of their country. Their skillful leadership of the wartime resistance had earned them the respect of the working class, and thanks to their efforts, French unionists had accepted low post-war wages and abstained from strikes in 1945 and 1946. However, their repeated support for draconian government austerity measures began to cost them votes in union elections, and in mid-1946, one U.S. State Department analyst reported that communist leaders, quote, could no longer hold back the discontent of the rank and file, unquote. When wildcat strikes and demonstrations erupted in mid-November 1947, the Communist Party was forced to support them or forfeit its leadership of the working class. At best, its support was half-hearted. But by late November, three million workers were out on strike, and the French economy was almost paralyzed. Ignoring their own analysts, U.S. foreign policy planners interpreted the 1947 strike as a political ploy on the part of the Communist Party and feared that it was a prelude to a, quote, takeover of the government. The reason for this blindness was simple. By mid-1947, the Cold War had frozen over, and all political events were seen in terms of the, quote, worldwide ideological clash between Eastern communism and Western democracy, unquote. 
Apprehensive over Soviet gains in the eastern Mediterranean and the growth of communist parties in Western Europe, the Truman administration drew up the multi-billion dollar European recovery plan in May, known popularly as the Marshall Plan, and established the CIA in September. Determined to save France from an imminent communist coup, the CIA moved in to help break up the strike, choosing the Socialist Party as its nightstick. On the surface, it may have seemed a bit out of character for the CIA to be backing anything so far left as a socialist party. However, there were only three major political parties in France, socialist, communist, and Gaullist. And by a simple process of elimination, the CIA wound up betting down with the socialists. While General de Gaulle was far too independent for American tastes, socialist leaders were rapidly losing political ground to the communists and were only too willing to collaborate with the CIA. Writing in the Saturday Evening Post in 1967, the former director of the CIA's International Organizations Division, Thomas W. Braden, explained the agency's strategy of using leftists to fight leftists. It was personified by J. Lovestone, he writes, assistant to David Dubinsky in the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. Once chief of the Communist Party in the United States, Lovestone had enormous grasp of foreign intelligence operations. In 1947, the Communist Confédération Générale du Travail led a strike in Paris, which came very close to paralyzing the French economy. A takeover of the government was feared. Into this crisis stepped Lovestone and his assistant, Irving Brown. With funds from Dubinsky's union, they organized Force Ouvrière, a non-communist union. When they ran out of money, they appealed to the CIA. Thus began the secret subsidy of free trade unions, which soon spread to Italy. Without that subsi subsidy, post-war history might have gone very differently. Shortly after the general strike began, the socialist factions split off from the CGT, the Confédération Générale du Travail, and forced, formed a separate union, Force Ouvrière, with CIA funds. CIA payments on the order of $1 million a year guaranteed the Socialist Party a strong electoral base in the labor movement and gave its leaders the political strength to lead the attack on striking workers. While Marseille socialist leader Gaston Deferre called for an anti-communist crusade from the floor of the National Assembly, and in the columns of Le Provençal, Socialist Minister of the Interior Jules Mock directed brutal police actions against striking workers. With the advice and cooperation of the U.S. military attaché in Paris, Mock requested the call-up of 80,000 reservists and mobilized 200,000 troops to battle the strikers. Faced with this overwhelming force, the CGT called off the strike on December 9th, after less than a month on the picket lines. Continuing. The bloodiest battleground of the general strike had not been in Paris, as Braden indicates, but in Marseille. Victory in Marseille was essential for U.S. foreign policy for a number of reasons. As one of the most important international ports in France, Marseille was a vital beachhead for Marshall Plan exports to Europe, Continued communist control of its docks would threaten the efficiency of the Marshall Plan and any future aid programs. As the second largest city in France, continued communist domination of the Marseille electorate would increase the chance that the Communist Party might win enough votes to form a national government. The Communist Party already controlled 28% of the vote and was the largest party in France. The growing split between Marseille's communist and socialist parties and Defer's willingness to serve American interests had already been revealed in National Assembly debates over the bloody incidents on November 12th in Marseille. Instead of criticizing the Garinis for beating the municipal councillors and, and murdering the sheet metal worker, socialist leader Gaston Defer chose to attack the communists. Quote, The American and English flags which were hanging from the city hall were slashed by communist hordes. We have proof of what the communists are capable. I trust that the government will take note of the consequences. The Socialist Party deplores these incidents, but it will not tolerate that those who try to pass here as representatives will be able to defy the law, unquote. Several days later, Communist Deputy Jean Christophol, C-R-I-S-T-O-F-O-L, rebutted the fair's accusations, charging that the Garini's gangsters were in the employ of both Gaullist and Socialist parties in Marseille. When Defer rose to deny even knowing Monsieur Guerini, another communist deputy reminded him that a Guerini cousin was the editor of Defer's newspaper, Le Pont Vassal. Then, Christophe took over, took over to reveal some disturbing indications that Marseille, that the Marseille milieu's revival, uh, some disturbing indications pointing to the Marseille milieu's revival. 
Underworld collaborators were being paroled from prison, and government officials were allowing, allowing milieu nightclubs to open, among them the Garini's Parakeet Club. The club had been closed in June of 1947 by order of Christophol himself, then town mayor. By the way, interrupting here, milieu here is a slang term for the Marseille underworld. It's kind of like the mob in American parlance, but milieu is a French slang term for the uh, for the Corsican syndicate in Marseille. The socialists, continuing now with politics of heroin in Southeast Asia, the socialists' first step in breaking Marseille's strike was purging suspected communist supporters from the CRS police units. Uh, interrupting again, the CRS police units were an ad hoc constabulary put together in Marseille, largely involving elements of the Marseille Communist Party, and it's worth noting that the CRS units had, uh, had uh, been very instrumental in cracking down, excuse me, on the milieu, on the Corsican syndicate in Marseille. Resuming. The socialists' first step in breaking Marseille's strike was purging suspected communist supporters from the CRS police units. Once this was accomplished, these units could easily be ordered to use violent tactics against the striking workers. Thus, although official reports had nothing but praise for the cool professionalism of these officers, socialist mayor Gaston Deferre unjustly accused them of having sided with the demonstrators during the rioting of November 12th. After socialist cadres drew up a list of suspected CRS communists, Mayor de Fer passed it along to Socialist Minister Jules Mock, M-O-C-H, who ordered the blacklisted officers fired. This action by the socialists was certainly appreciated by the hard-pressed Corsican syndicates as well. In sharp contrast to the regular police, CRS units had been cracking down on the milieu's smuggling and black market activities. Once these communist officers had been purged, CRS units started attacking picket lines with unrestrained violence. But it would take more than ordinary police repression to break the determination of Marseille's 80,000 striking workers. If the U.S. was to have its victory in Marseille, it would have to fight for it. And the CIA proceeded to do just that. Through their contacts with the Socialist Party, the CIA had sent agents and a psychological warfare team to Marseille, where they dealt directly with Corsican syndicate leaders through the Garini brothers. The CIA's operatives supplied arms and money to Corsican gangs for assaults on communist picket lines and harassment of the important union officials. During the month-long strike, the CIA's gangsters and the purged CRS police units murdered, murdered a number of striking workers and mauled the picket lines. Finally, the CIA psychological warfare team prepared pamphlets, radio broadcasts, and posters aimed at discouraging workers from continuing the strike. Some of the Psy War team's maneuvers were inspired. At one point, the American government threatened to ship 65,000 sacks of flour meant for the hungry city back to the United States unless the dockers unloaded them immediately. The pressure of violence and hunger was too great, and on December 9th, Marseille's workers abandoned the strike, along with their fellow workers in the rest of France. There were some ironic finishing touches. On Christmas Eve of 1947, 87 boxcars arrived at the Marseille train station carrying flour, milk, sugar and fruit as gifts from the American people, unquote, amidst the cheers of hundreds of school children waving tiny American flags. The Garinis gained enough power and status from their role in smashing the 1947 strike to emerge as the new leaders of the Corsican underworld. But while the CIA was instrumental in restoring the Corsican underworld's political power, it was not until the 1950 dock strike that the Garinis gained enough power to take control of the Marseille waterfront. This combination of political influence and control of the docks created the perfect environmental conditions for the growth of Marseille's heroin laboratories, fortuitously at exactly the same time that Mafia boss Lucky Luciano was seeking an alternate source of heroin supply. So again, we see where the growth of the heroin trade is inextricably linked with the use by intelligence, specifically the CIA, well, which has just been created, the use of intel intelligence's use of uh, underworld gangs, the very people who deal in heroin, as political hitmen to prevent the rise of any sort of, of alternative or leftist governments in Europe immediately post-World War II. Of course, this was exactly the role that we saw the Sicilian Mafia installed in by the OSS and AMGOT in Italy and in Sicily. Continuing now. The same austere economic conditions that had sparked the 1947 strike also produced the 1950 shutdown. Conditions for the workers had not improved in the intervening three years and, if anything, had grown worse. Marseille, with its tradition of working-class militancy, had even more reason for striking. Marseille was France's gateway to the Orient, through which material, particularly American munitions and supplies, was transported to the French Expeditionary Corps fighting in Indochina. 
The Indochina was about as unpopular with the French people then as the Vietnam War is with so many of the American people today. By the way, for those of you who are our long, younger listeners or are not real familiar with history, the Indochina War was France's, uh, uh, France being thrown out of Vietnam. It is the Vietnamese War. It's just the first part of the Vietnamese War. Um, Vietnam was called Indochina in those days. The Indochina War was about as unpopular with the French people as the Vietnam War is with so many American people today. Um, this was written in 1972. And Ho Chi Minh had helped to found the French Communist Party and was a popular hero in France among the leftist working class members, especially in Marseille with its many resident Indochinese. In January, Marseille dock workers began a selective boycott of those freighters carrying supplies to the war zone. And on February 3rd, the CGT convened a meeting of Marseille dock workers at which a declaration was issued demanding, quote, the return of the Expeditionary Corps from Indochina to put an end to the war in Vietnam, and urging, quote, all unions to launch the most effective actions possible against the war in Vietnam, unquote. The movement of arms shipments to Indochina was paralyzed. Although the Atlantic ports joined in the embargo in early February, they were not as effective or as important as the Marseille strike. By mid-February, the shutdown had spread to the metal industries, the mines, and the railways. But most of the strikes were half-hearted. On February 18th, the Paris newspaper Combat reported that Marseille was once again the hard core. Seventy percent of Marseille's workers supported the strike, compared to only two percent in Bordeaux, twenty percent in Toulouse, and twenty percent in Nice. Once more, Marseille's working-class militancy called for special methods, and the CIA's Thomas Braden later recalled how he dealt with the problem. Quote, On the desk in front of me as I write these lines is a creased and faded yellow paper. It bears the following inscription in pencil. Quote, Received from Warren G. Haskins, $15,000, signed Norris A. Grambo, unquote. I went in search of this paper on the day the newspapers disclosed the, quote, scandal of the Central Intelligence Agency's connections with American students and labor leaders. It was a wistful search, and when it ended, I found myself feeling sad. For I was Warren G. Haskins. Norris A. Grambo was Irving Brown of the American Federation of Labor. The $15,000 was from the vaults of the CIA, and the yellow paper is the last memento I possess of a vast and secret operation. It was my idea to give $15,000 to Irving Brown. He needed it to pay off his strong-arm squads in the Mediterranean ports so that American supplies could be unloaded against the opposition of communist dock workers, unquote. With the CIA's financial backing, Brown used his contacts with the underworld and a, quote, rugged, fiery Corsican, unquote, named Pierre Ferry Pisani to recruit an elite criminal terror squad to work the docks. Surrounded by his gangster hirelings, Ferry Pisani stormed into local communist headquarters and threatened to make the party's leadership, quote, pay personally for the continuing boycott. And, as Time magazine noted with great satisfaction, Quote, the first communist who tried to fire Ferry Pisani's men was chucked into the harbor, unquote. In addition, the Guarini's gangsters were assigned the job of pummeling communist picket lines to allow troops and scabs onto the docks, where they could begin loading munitions and supplies. By March 13th, government officials were able to announce that, despite a continuing boycott by communist workers, 900 dockers and supplement supplementary troops had restored normal operations on the Marseille waterfront. Although sporadic boycotts continued until mid-April, Marseille was now subdued and the strike was essentially over. But there were unforeseen consequences of these Cold War, quote, victories. In supplying the Corsican syndicates with money and support, the CIA broke the last barrier to unrestricted Corsican smuggling operations in Marseille. When control over the docks was compounded with the political influence the milieu gained with CIA assistance in 1947, Conditions were ideal for Marseille's growth as America's heroin laboratory. The French police later reported that Marseille's first heroin laboratories were opened in 1951, only months after the milieu took over the waterfront. Gaston de Fer and the Socialist Party also emerged victorious after the 1947 and 1950 strikes weakened the local Communist Party. From 1953 until the present, the Socialists, De Fer and the Socialists, have enjoyed an unbroken political reign over the Marseille municipal government. The Guerinis seem to have maintained a relationship with Marseille's Socialists. 
Members of the Guarini organization acted as bodyguards and campaign workers for local socialist candidates until the family's downfall in 1967. The control of the Guarini brothers over Marseille's heroin industry was so complete that for nearly 20 years they were able to impose an absolute ban on drug peddling inside France. At the same time, they were exporting vast quantities of heroin to the United States. With their decline in power, due mostly to their unsuccessful vendetta with Marcel Franceschi in the mid-1960s, their embargo on domestic drug trafficking became unenforceable, and France developed a drug problem of her own. Now, before we go on and discuss this, I just want to check with you, Dave. Is this not the same Tom Braden who has uh, since become a TV broadcaster? Yes. And, and, and not only that, but it, on uh, the cable news, he's, he's the resident liberal. Exactly. He's the, he is the left to uh, Pat Buchanan's right, which is, um, again, folks, just evidence of the kind of, uh, of uh, real wide range of opinions that we have available to us on network broadcasting. As Dave is talking about, we're talking about a program on CNN uh, called Crossfire, where Tom Braden, this guy who's talking about um, helping uh, Irving Brown and his federation to pay off the Corsican thugs on the docks to beat up and kill communists. This guy is now representing the left on a, on a cable television uh, uh, debate program. Anyway, so now what we've seen here is in the 1947 and 1950 strikes in Marseille that direct CIA support and psychological warfare and money support at that of the Corsican gangsters um, led to essentially uh, creating the perfect environment for the heroin laboratories that would become the major heroin laboratories supplying the United States. So time after time, we've seen it already in Sicily and in France, where direct intervention by American intelligence and military has put the gangsters in power and then has given the gangsters the power themselves to begin the heroin traffic. And as we're going to see, folks, these are not isolated occurrences, and in fact, the pattern begins, uh, continues to grow and grow and grow. And again, reiterating, we have uh, U.S. intelligence alliances with the Sicilian Mafia and the Union Chorus using both. Well, the Sicilian Mafia initially used uh, to guard the U.S. waterfront and eventually also used to help pave the way for Patton's invasion of Sicily. But the primary role of both the Mafia in Sicily, the Union Chorus in Marseille, are as anti-communist cadres. The power given to these two criminal syndicates via their alliance with U.S. intelligence places them in a position to effect a resurgence of the world heroin trade, and that's just what they did. We've already looked at uh, the Luciano organization's resurgence in Sicily and its eventual use of Cuba as a transshipment point. Now we're going to take a look at the alliance, at, at uh, how both of these groups, both the Sicilian Mafia, the Honorata Societa under Lucky Luciano, and the Union Chorus in Marseille, and we're going to look at these two groups hooking up. Again, the two, the two criminal syndicates boosted by U.S. intelligence via their support for the, the, these syndicates as anti-communist cadres now hook up and dominate the world heroin trade. Returning once again to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. The basic Turkey-Italy-America heroin route continued to dominate the international heroin traffic for almost 20 years with only one important alteration. During the 1950s, the Sicilian Mafia began to divest itself of the heroin manufacturing business and started relying on Marseille's Corsican syndicates for their drug supplies. There were two reasons for this change. As the diverted supplies of legally produced Chaparelli heroin began to dry up in 1950 and 51, Luciano was faced with the alternative of expanding his own clandestine laboratories or seeking another source of supply. While the Sicilian mafiosi were capable international smugglers, they seemed to lack the ability to manage. The, to, they seemed to lack the ability to manage the clandestine laboratories. Almost from the beginning, illicit heroin production in Italy had been plagued by a series of arrests, due more to mafiosi incompetence than anything else, of couriers moving supplies in and out of laboratories. The implications were serious. If the seizures continued, Luciano himself might eventually be arrested. Preferring to minimize the risks of direct involvement, Luciano apparently decided to shift his major su source of supply to Marseille. There, Corsican syndicates had gained political power and control of the waterfront as a result of their involvement in CIA strike-breaking activities. Thus, Italy gradually declined in importance as a center for illicit drug manufacturing, and Marseille became the heroin capital of Europe. Although it is difficult to probe the inner workings of such a clandestine business under the best of circumstances, there is reason to believe that Meyer Lansky's 1949-50 European tour was instrumental in promoting Marseille's heroin industry. After crossing the Atlantic in a luxury liner, Lansky visited Luciano in Rome where they discussed the narcotics trade. He then traveled to Zurich and contacted prominent Swiss bankers through John Pullman, an old friend from the rum-running days. 
These negotiations established a financial labyrinth that organized crime still uses today to smuggle its enormous gambling and heroin profits out of the country into numbered Swiss bank accounts without attracting the notice of the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. So again, the two crime syndicates boosted into a position of primacy in Italy and France and Sicily by virtue of their alliances with the U.S. intelligence have now hooked up and represent the dominant uh, factor in importing heroin. Now, this connection, folks, the one we've just been looking at here, this cooperation between the Sicilian Mafia and the Union Chorus, the transshipment going first from Turkey to Sicily to the Marseille laboratories down to Cuba and up into the United States, that is the French connection, about which the uh, series of popular movies starring Gene Hackman uh, was about, oh, maybe a decade or two ago. The, but th that, that connection, that French connection, which has proved just as elusive as in the popular motion pictures, was formed through this alliance with U.S. intelligence with these criminal syndicates. The phenomena we've just described is the formation of the so-called French connection. And as we're going to talk about a little bit later in the broadcast, and as many of our, our uh, longtime listeners are familiar with the book that we uh, quote from very often, and I think we're even going to use uh, at least once tonight, The Great Heroin Coup by Heinrich Kruger, is about the overthrow. The word coup in this case refers to the overthrow of the French connection, the old French connection, heroin traffic, by um, a, a heroin connection found more uh, uh, amicable to the Nixon administration, and we'll get into that later, and that's the Golden Triangle heroin connection. So we're going to talk, but that's the heroin heroin coup ref referred to in the book, The Great Heroin Coup. Now, so far, we've taken a look at a, a, a wartime alliance and an immediate post-war alliance between U.S. intelligence and criminal syndicates in both Sicily and Marseille and Corsica, the Honorata Societa, or Mafia as it's commonly known, and the Union Chorus, the Corsican organized crime syndicate so influential in Marseille. Now we're going to take a look at an alliance between U.S. intelligence and an organized crime syndicate, again, with very strong political and anti-communist overtones and activities, this one in China. Indeed. Now, those of you who uh, are, again, perhaps not as familiar as they'd like to be with, uh, with, uh, with world history uh, may have heard of Chiang Kai-shek and not be exactly sure of where he came from. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was a man who rose out of the chaos that was China um, at the turn of the century. Um, there was a, a period at the time when the, the influence of uh, the, the Chinese government, the, the royal, the monarchy in China had declined sharply. Um, more and more, the Chinese were being dominated in the coast cities by the European powers who had set these coast cities up, places like Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, etc. Um, and uh, basically, China was a country torn apart, a huge country, too. It's still, and, and even at that time, it was by far the most populous country in the world, in utter and total political disarray. Well, as so often happens in these cases, and we're seeing it right now um, in Corazon Aquino's attempt to uh, try and standardize the government of the Philippines a little bit. She's facing a lot of resistance from warlords scattered all over the provinces. Well, this is what China was like in the 19-teens and 1920s. It was essentially the province of the Europeans in the capital cities, um, the old monarchy and the elite, and some of those people in the, ca in, the, in the coastal cities, and warlords out in the provinces. And warlords were exactly what they sounded like. Essentially, um, it was strong man rule. Um, they were small groups of essentially armed, armed bandits who had set themselves up in positions of power. A lot of these people were, in fact, themselves very heavily involved with the then burgeoning opium traffic in China. Right. Now, it's worth noting that initially there was an alliance between a group called the Kuomintang, then headed up by a man named Sun Yat-sen, who's generally regarded as probably the, the single greatest patriotic figure in the history of China, although, you know, perhaps one could call Mao Zedong or someone else at this stage of the game. But for many, many years, Sun Yat-sen Sun Yat was the dominant patriotic figure in China. His political group, the Kuomintang, or KMT, as we'll see it abbreviated here, set about to centralize China. While Sun Yat-sen was heading up the Kuomintang, they formed a political alliance with the Chinese Communist Party for the purpose of overcoming the warlords and centralizing China. When Sun Yat-sen died, the Kuomintang was taken over by Chiang Kai-shek, who was bitterly anti-communist and while at the same time maintaining the appearance of preserving the alliance Sun Yat-sen had formed with the Chinese Communist Party, in fact, Chiang Kai-shek set about completely 
plotting against that party, often with the connivance of some of the very warlords he was supposedly trying to conquer. And uh, eventually, Chang uh, initiated a very bloody purge, which was to set off a, uh, a civil war lasting roughly two decades, going through the period of the World War II, and eventually culminating in the Chinese uh, takeover of the country. And, of course, to this day, the mainland of China is the People's Republic. But it began with this break between the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communists under Chiang Kai-shek. Indeed, and as Dave mentioned, at the time when uh, Chiang Kai-shek pulled the Nationalist Party away from its its more progressive roots, uh, he made alliances with, among other people, the warlords and the reactionary elements that had been left over from the old monarchic days. Okay, so here's this is Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, the, he himself, a sort of young warlord in charge of Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party, um, and KMT, the Kuomintang, uh, the party he was in charge of. Chiang's control of Shanghai was made possible with the aid of two main groups. Wealthy merchants and foreign capitalists supported the KMT with the understanding that there would be no reforms that threatened their interests. And Shanghai's major criminal groups strengthened their own hold on official power by enabling Chiang to destroy the city's Communist Party and labor movement in 1927. These Shanghai criminal organizations were dominated by two secret society groups called the, the, called the Green and Red Circles, or gangs. Secret societies, whether political, social, or criminal, were traditionally an important force in Chinese society whenever central authority broke down. During the 19th century, the Red and Green gangs had drawn their membership from people involved in transporting grain and smuggling salt along the Grand Canal, China's primary north-south north -south inland waterway. After 1911, these groups shifted their activities to the cities of central China, particularly to Shanghai. Shanghai had been an important Chinese center for the opium traffic since the 1840s, when Britain's victory in the Opium War opened the port to foreign trade and the establishment of foreign-controlled areas, or concessions, which by the 1930s included almost a third of the city's 3.5 million people. The city's tradition of involvement in opium and other vices that tended to accompany the Western presence in Asia was tailor-made for the green and red gangs. Both evolved into criminal organizations whose role in the narcotics trade and in the anti-communist movement suggest parallels with the roles of the Sicilian Mafia and Corsican syndicate groups in Europe. One of Shanghai's most influential citizens was Tu Yue Sheng, narcotics overlord, anti-Japanese patriot, and leader of the Green Gang, who began his career in Shanghai's French settlement, a noted center of illicit activities where criminals were permitted to operate freely. Nip, we may want to spell some of these uh, complicated Chinese names for people, because I, I know that probably, if I was listening, I wouldn't necessarily know, be able to anticipate how that was spelled. Good point. Uh, the one we're talking about now, of course, the uh, the narcotics overlord and head of the Green Gang is Tu. That's the last name in Chinese, of course, it's it's put first. T-U, Tu. And then his first name is Yue Sheng, Y-U-E-H dash S-H-E-N-G. Tu Yue Sheng, narcotics overlord, anti-Japanese patriot and leader of the Green Gang, who began his career in Shanghai's French settlement, a noted center of illicit activities where criminals were permitted to operate freely. In exchange for tax profits on vice, the French turned the administration of the settlement over to the gangs. Tu became the protege of a man known as pockmarked, Huang, H-U-A-N-G, who is the chief of detectives in the French concession and a major green gang leader. In addition to owning several opium dens, Huang served an important function as intermediary in negotiations and disputes between various groups in the foreign-controlled and Chinese settlements. Prior to 1918, Shanghai's opium traffic was based in the British concession under the control of Chinese from the Swatow area of Kwangtung province. In 1918, the British concession cracked down on opium, depriving the Swato group of its base and opening the traffic to take over by the Green Gang, operating from the French concession. During the 1920s, Tu Yue Sheng unified the competing gangster organizations involved in the drug traffic and extended his influence from the French settlement out to the more prosperous international settlement. Tu became one of the, quote, big three among the Shanghai gangsters, working with pockmarked Huang and Chang Xiaolin, spelled C-H-A-N-G, and then the other name H-S-I-A-O-L-I-N. This unholy triumvirate controlled the city's underworld in early 1927, when Jiang's when northern expedition forces approached. Now, this is Chiang Kai-shek they're talking about. 
when Jiang's northern expedition forces approached. In late February 1927, labor unions allied with the KMT, again, Jiang's political party, moved against warlord control and foreign economic domination and began a general strike, planning to welcome Jiang's armies to a liberated Shanghai. For his part, Jiang Kai-shek was actively courting the support of wealthy conservative and foreign businessmen. A strong united labor movement was a major impediment. Consequently, in late February, Jiang's forces delayed their advance toward the city, hoping that reprisals by the British-run International Settlement Police and the Chinese garrison commander would break the strike and destroy its leadership. Despite bloody reprisals, labor organizers ordered a second strike to begin March 21st, a massive display of workers' power that shut down the city once again in anticipation of the KMT's victorious advance. Although there was disturbing evidence that Jiang was beginning to conduct a violent purge of communists and suspected communists in the cities under his control, the communist leadership, with the encouragement of Comintern advisers, doggedly continued to support the alliance and, with increasing difficulty, ignored the ominous signs of KMT treachery. The strike caused considerable consternation in the Chinese and foreign business communities, and Jiang set about persuading these interests to support him. Simultaneously, avoiding a public declaration of outright hostility toward the communists, on arriving in Shanghai in late March, he met first with Park Mark Twang, and later with leading Chinese industrialists and bankers who became satisfied that under Chiang's control there would be no further trouble from organized labor. The gratified businessmen then presented him with a quote loan of three million Shanghai dollars, the first of a series of lucrative donations. Okay, so what we're seeing here, as we mentioned at the beginning, is Chiang Kai-shek taking originally a nationalist movement. In, in this case,、um, the the Kuomintang Party, originally a nationalist and progressive movement interested in unifying the government of China,、um, and not only taking it over, but then beginning a purge of the communists and actually betraying、uh, the nationalist supporters in the city who are doing who are performing a labor strike against foreign economic domination. Instead, Chiang Kai-shek has already decided that foreign domination is what he's interested in, and、uh, sits outside the city, much in the same way that the Americans refuse to drop arms to the uh, to the, uh, the the communist、uh, resistance in northern Italy.、Um, Chiang Kai-shek decides to wait outside the city to see if the British and the Chinese garrison soldiers、uh, wipe out the strikers, who again, remember, are people who are supposed to be、uh, his allies. These are, but but the fact that they are labor, the fact that they are progressive,、um, and the fact that Chiang Kai-shek was even at that point moving to the extreme right、uh, meant that they were no longer useful to him. So Chiang Kai-shek comes into Shanghai after allowing the、uh, the strike to be uh, uh, severely stomped on, and immediately begins to court、um, the local gangsters in the person of Park Mark Twang,、um, who had already been a part of the power structure, and also the local businessmen, who then give him three million dollars. So Chiang Kai-shek is now riding tall in the saddle in Shanghai and beginning to thoroughly purge any leftist or moderate elements out of his nationalist party. And broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. Now, returning again to China from、uh, here in the South South Bay, California, the it, the main ally that Chiang Kai-shek enlisted in order to break the working class of Shanghai was none other than Tu Yuesheng, one of the big three unquote of Shanghai gangsters. And for our purposes here, perhaps no, most noteworthy, the man who at this point dominates the opium traffic in Shanghai. Returning to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. Chiang had some 3,000 troops under his command in the city, pitted against a larger but poorly armed force of workers and communists. He doubted whether his soldiers could be trusted to turn against the workers' groups, which they considered their main allies, and turned to Tu Yuesheng and his colleagues for help. It is widely believed that Chiang, in his youth, had become a fully initiated member of Shanghai's Green Gang. Regardless of whether this is the case, Chiang and the Green Gang shared a common interest in destroying Shanghai's labor movement. By serving Chang, the gangs could and did increase their influence and wealth. At Chang's behest, two organized a moderate labor group, the Common Advancement Association, which recruited and armed thousands of gangsters throughout the city. The communists and other labor leaders, pathetically, tragically, determined to maintain the charade of alliance with the KMT, were taken by surprise and massacred. Many of them by Tu's gangsters, beginning April 12, 1927. And, and continuing sporadically for months. As a result of this coup, 
Shanghai's gang leaders grew even more powerful. In appreciation for their services and their deliberate and anticipated performance as intermediaries between Chang and the foreign community, the Big Three were appointed as honorary advisors, unquote, to the nationalist government. Furthermore, Tu Yueshang was made a major general at Chang's headquarters in addition to serving as a municipal official and as an employee of the American-owned Shanghai Power Company. As the purge continued, after 1927, the gangsters, with Kuomintang and foreign support, thoroughly infiltrated Shanghai's labor movement in order to prevent a recurrence of the pre-1927 threat, unquote, from organized labor. In September of 1931, for example, one non-communist labor organizer who had led a tramway strike in the French settlement was denounced, arrested, and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment after a trial that lasted 10 minutes. Chiang Kai-shek's opium programs further illustrate the gap between the Kuomintang's original political idealism and the sordid reality of conditions under his dictatorship. Like the warlords, Chiang needed money to finance his military campaigns, and in August of 1927, the nationalists legalized the opium trade, setting up a monopoly to tax opium sales. Before public pressure forced the scheme's abolition in July of 1928, the government had made an estimated 40 million Chinese dollars. Unofficial government sponsorship of the opium trade continued, and Tu Yueshang was a central figure until 1931, when he reportedly cured his own addiction and dropped out of gambling and the drug traffic, leaving its operation to other members of the Green Gang. To compensate for Tu's financial loss, one of his close friends was given control of the newly formed state lottery, while Tu devoted his full attention to suppressing Shanghai's labor movement. The most well-publicized nationalist campaign against opium was begun in 1934. Chang was beginning a new life movement, unquote, which derived from the Confucian belief that individual reform is the key to curing the ills of society. The programs of the new life movement, outmoded and hopelessly inadequate, never began to solve China's pressing social problems. But its idealism and Chang's own professed Christianity were incompatible with the drug traffic. A National Opium Suppression Bureau was organized whose regulations involved penalty, penalties of life imprisonment or death for pushers. Although improving social welfare was the stated aim of this anti-opium campaign, its major objective was to gain control of the financial base of Chang's warlord opponents. The Kuomintang leader appointed himself commissioner for opium suppression in 1935. By 1936, he had succeeded in rerouting opium moving toward the coast from Yunnan and Quechow so that it was sent north through Hangkow on the Yangtze River and then to Shanghai, thus depriving, depriving Kwangxi province of its opium revenue. Opium production was reduced, but the government generally hoarded seized opium instead of destroying it. According to one source, during the period 1934-7, to 7, the government made an estimated 500 million Chinese dollars from its suppression program. Japan mounted a full-scale invasion of China in 1937, driving the Kuomintang government into the interior. Although the war in the Pacific halted the flow of heroin from China to the United States after 1941, the drug traffic from China continued. During the war, the Kuomintang and the Japanese freely traded a variety of goods, including opium, across mostly stagnant battle lines. Japan played an official role in the narcotics business in occupied China. In Manchuria, the Japanese authorities used opium as a revenue source. In 1938, its sale accounted for 28% of general budget receipts. Nanking, under Japanese occupation, had an estimated 50,000 heroin addicts, and in Shanghai, about one-sixth of the $1.5 million spent every month on drugs was used to buy heroin. The Japanese invasion separated Chiang Kai-shek from his main source of financial support, but his government had a store of Sichuanese opium that had been confiscated during the suppression drive. Tu Yue-sheng took charge of shipping the seized opium to the coast, and eventually it was sold at Macau and Hong Kong, both then under Japanese control. Some of the same stock was finally sold by Shanghai's official monopoly, which operated under Japanese protection. After Japan's defeat in 1945, Chang's forces made a speedy return to Shanghai, acting with the support of the American government and the cooperation of the defeated Japanese in order to reaffirm Kuomintang control and forestall the communists. Once again, corruption and vice, including narcotics, flourished with the participation of China's nationalist officials. So let's take a look at what we've looked at here so far. We've taken a look, first of all, at how Tu Yue Sheng, a Shanghai gangster, came to monopolize the, the opium trade 
in Shanghai. We then took a look at how his aide was enlisted by Chiang Kai-shek and the Green Gang, Tu Yue Shang's criminal syndicate, was then used as a sort of, again, an anti-communist cadre by the Kuomintang in order to put down the Chinese workers in Shanghai. And it's worth noting also that even after Tu Yue Shang himself got out of the opium traffic, he delegated the control of the opium trade to other members of the Green Gang. And at this point, the, the Green Gang under Tu Yue Shang is basically functioning as an agent or as an arm of the Kuomintang National Security Establishment. It's also worth noting here, and this is a pattern we're going to be looking at uh, so uh, much, much uh, later in the series, and it's, it's, it's unfortunately a very common pattern of the very governments that are uh, pro professing to control the opium trade, in fact, use the drug control apparatus to maintain control of that traffic and to manipulate it for political ends. In this case, we've seen Chiang Kai-shek denying his warlord opponents the revenue from the opium trade at the same time as that very opium trade is used to provide revenues for his own organization, and including, again, the Green Gang under Tu Yue Sheng. Now, this Green Gang is very, very important because the Green Gang, like a lot of other criminal syndicates we've looked at, eventually came to work for U.S. intelligence. I'm going to read a very short segment now, but we'll be reading more later on from a wonderful book um, called The Great Heroin Coup, which we've used quite a bit on our broadcasts. We'll be using this book a lot in other other broadcasts in this series. Indeed. It's, it's a wonderful work. Uh, we were just talking to one of the KFJC people here tonight about it. Uh, also a book that is not currently in print, I don't believe, but one that if you can track it down in a library, or if you especially find a used copy somewhere, or you want to contact uh, perhaps uh, Tom Davis or somebody like that um, for a copy, you would be it would be more than worth your time to do it. Uh, the book is, again, titled the Great Heroin Coup, Drugs, Intelligence, and International Fascism. Copyright 1980, the author Heinrich Kruger. And uh, the book was originally published by South End Press in Boston. Okay. Well, by the way, we're going to be reading here. The book has an excellent foreword by Peter Dale Scott, one of the top political researchers in this country and a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He wrote an excellent foreword to this book, and it's from this foreword that we're going to be quoting right now. Indeed. Okay, small segment here. The U.S. government's narcotics mafia connection goes back, as is well known, to World War II. Two controversial joint operations between OSS, Office of Strategic Services, and ONI, U.S. Naval Intelligence, established contacts via Lucky Luciano with the Sicilian Mafia and via Tai Li, who we will be talking about more on the broadcast, with the dope-dealing green gang of Tu Yue Sheng in Shanghai. Both connections were extended into the post-war period as the Luciano and KMT network slowly resumed their pre-war contacts. So what we're going to be looking at now, as is mentioned briefly in Peter Dell Scott's foreword, is not only the fact of Chiang Kai-shek and his collusion with Tu Jie Sheng's uh, Shanghai Dope Syndicate, the Green Gang, but in fact the direct connections of the U.S. government through Chiang Kai-shek and through Tai Li, who we're going to be talking about during the broadcast, right into that same milieu in just the same way that we became involved in heroin traffic in Sicily and in Marseille. Although it should be noted that the involvement of U.S. intelligence with the narcotics traffic in the, in the cases of Sicily and Marseille, and so far also in uh, China, was is, is indirect. In other words, the support given to these organized crime syndicates enabled them to become prime players, because later on we're going to be dealing with U.S. intelligence involvement directly yes, to this in point, the traffic. Good, right. good, well said. To this point, uh, the, the, it's again, it's a purely political maneuver on the part of the American intelligence and military establishments, but as we shall see, um, it's very hard to plant those kinds of seeds without reaping the kinds of plants that grow out of them. Indeed, and uh, those plants have indeed been reaped. And again, at this point, the, the political influence creates the political circumstances leading to the resurgence of, with a vengeance of the international heroin traffic, and eventually we'll look at direct, again, direct U.S. participation, direct participation of U.S. intelligence services in that traffic. Now remember, the Green Gang under Tu Yue Sheng are being used as, in essence, a, a, a branch of the Kuomintang National Security Establishment, an anti-communist cadre in much the same fashion as the OSS and CIA used the Sicilian Mafia and Union Chorus in the examples we looked at earlier. Once again, U.S. intelligence was to form an alliance with the Green Gang, this time through a fellow named Tai Li, who was over Tu Yue Sheng in the Kuomintang National Security Establishment. We're going to be reading now about the alliance between the Green Gang, Tai Li, Tu Yue Sheng, and U.S. Intelligence from a book called OSS, subtitled A Secret History of America's First Central Intelligence Agency, published by, or authored rather, by R. Harris Smith, 
and it was published in hardcover by the University of California Press, Berkeley, 1972. So, again, R. Harris Smith, OSS, about the alliance between U.S. intelligence, Tai Lee, Tu Yue Shang, and the Green Gang. Algen Lucy, L-U-S-E-Y, a former United States, a former U United Press correspondent in Shanghai, was a second Donovan agent at the Chinese capital. Interrupting, uh, William Donovan was the head of OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, America's wartime intelligence service. Beginning again, Algen Lucy, a former United Press correspondent in Shanghai, was a second Donovan agent at the Chinese capital. He had first been hired as a propaganda specialist by the Sherwood branch of COL. Lucy had little contact with Gale, having been assured by, quote, some very influential and powerful Chinese, unquote, that the professor was not in the best of repute, unquote. Beside hatching a futile plot to smuggle submachine guns to the Formosan independence movement, unquote, Lucy devoted his energies to cult cultivating the friendship of Captain Milton Mary Miles, M-I-L-E-S, a naval officer who flew to China in May of 1942 with vague orders to find out what is going on out there, unquote, and to do whatever you can to help the Navy and to heckle the Japanese, unquote. What most interested Lucy was that Miles, an experienced veteran of the U.S. Asiatic Squadron, had developed close ties to a mysterious Chinese general named Tai Li, that's T-A-I, and then L-I. Operating under the innocuous title of Director, Bureau of Investigation and Statistics, unquote, Tai Li was actually the chief of a combined secret police and intelligence organization said to control over 300,000 agents throughout China and in every foreign nation where Chinese communities existed, from Bangkok to Saigon to San Francisco. The short, stocky Chinese was a shadowy figure who had achieved legendary stature. There were whispered tales of his miraculous escapes from countless Japanese assassination attempts. It was rumored that he had acquired great wealth throughout his control... Th he had acquired great wealth through his control of the opium trade, that he supervised concentration camps for critics of the Chang government, that he had no qualms about ensuring thought control through political executions. General Tai, according to one OSS report, was, quote, not the Admiral Canaris of China, but the Heinrich Himmler. Uh, interrupting to place that reference, Admiral Canaris was the head of the Obwehr, German, German military intelligence during World War II, and of course Heinrich Himmler was the head of the SS. And uh, again, one OSS report compared him, said that he was more like Hitler, Himmler rather, than Admiral Canaris, more like a uh, repressive terror chief and, uh, and butcher than a true espionage uh, master. Continuing. Tai Li was also the, quote, completely trusted subordinate and guardian of the Generalissimo, subject only to the Generalissimo's orders, unquote. His loyalty to Chang was a unique, tra was a unique trait among the merry nest of gangsters, General Stilwell's term, who comprised the Kuomintang administration. Their friendship went back to the 1920s when Tai Li had joined the Chinese Communist Party to spy for Chang, his military mentor. The Generalissimo then turned against his communist allies, and Tai Li was assigned the task of persecuting his former comrades. The general acquired the services of an underworld group of Shanghai hoodlums, the Green Gang, who specialized in kidnapping and extortion and gave them official respectability as the foundation for his secret police organization. General Tai also had a long-standing reputation as a xenophobe who rarely met with foreigners. That was why Captain Miles' friendship with the enigmatic general was of such great interest to Lucy. With the agreement of Chiang Kai-shek, Tai Li had already suggested to Miles that they cooperate in a Sino-American friendship plan for the training of thousands of Chinese guerrillas and espionage agents. Miles had at first been suspicious of Tai Li. When he learned that General Tai's men had developed poisons in the form of Bayer aspirin tablets and Carter's little liver pills, he rushed home to collect all his household medicines and locked them away in a four-combination safe. But his wariness faded, and he soon refused to believe that Tai Li was, quote, the head of a Chinese OGPU with which anyone from the United States would be embarrassed to associate, unquote. Without consulting Washington, Miles agreed to the friendship plan. Lucy had mixed feelings about the project. He informed Washington that Tai, Lai's or tai Li's organization was, quote, very efficient and we can use it to great advantage. It is also considered utterly ruthless, and the inner circle impresses me as being a bunch of cutthroats, unquote. Nevertheless, to keep in Miles' good graces, Lucy asked OSS headquarters to help procure a shipment of short-barreled shotguns for the use of Tai Lee's, quote, swell bunch of hard-hitting, honest men, good gunmen in the occupied territories, unquote. So before Nip continues with the saga of Tai Lee and the OSS, let's review very briefly. Of course, we've looked already at Tu Yue Sheng, Shanghai organized crime leader, 
head of the Green Gang, and in that capacity, the monopoly it has a monopoly over the Shanghai opium traffic. Chiang Kai-shek's government itself becomes sort of the official uh, guarantor of the opium traffic, controlling it in political means, in political ways, in order to deny the warlords opium revenue while guaranteeing his own Kuomintang organization that very same revenue. The Green Gang is then used by Chiang Kai-shek to suppress workers' strikes in Shanghai. It then becomes an official wing of the Kuomintang military and intelligence apparatus, and Tu Yue-sheng himself becomes a general under Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek's intelligence chief, Tai Li, uses the Green Gang as the foundation for his, all, his, his organization throughout China. So we've got Tai Li over Tu Yue-sheng and the Green Gang using this criminal syndicate as an inextricable part of his own intelligence system. And now we've seen Tai Li working with uh, Officer Miles of U.S. Naval Intelligence and this relationship between Tai Li, Tu Yue-sheng, the Green Gang, and U.S. Intelligence is to be cemented. Now... Chiang Kai-shek, of course, because of the fact that Tai Li was one of the few people of his uh, gang of, of uh, merry bandits or whatever it was that was Stillwell's term, um, one of the few people that he trusted um, thought it was a great idea that the, that, that the OSS should make their connections with his intelligence service in the person of Tai Li. So Chiang Kai-shek pressed for the acceptance of this quote-unquote friendship plan to connect the two services. And uh, Washington, which had, had uh, very little other ways to get a lot of, get a lot of the intelligence uh, information that they wanted in Asia, uh, reluctantly went along with it. Reading again from OSS by R. Harris Smith, After several months of negotiations, and with Roosevelt's verbal approval, Donovan and Secretary of the Navy Knox put their signatures, Donovan again, of course, is William Donovan of the OSS, Donovan and Secretary of the Navy Knox put their signatures to a secret technical agreement with the Chinese government. This pact created a joint secret service, the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, SACO, under the directorship of Tai Li. Miles was Deputy Director as well as Far Eastern Chief of OSS and Commander of Navy Group China. SACO, SACO, was to engage in guerrilla training espionage, guerrilla training, espionage, sabotage, and radio interception. The Chinese agreed to supply manpower and facilities while arms and equipment would come from the United States. It should just briefly be mentioned to those of you who are not familiar, um, one of the great curses of General Stilwell, General Stilwell was probably one of the greatest generals in the history of the United States, and a man who, because of the political situation that he got stuck into, which was the, the maelstrom that was World War II China, uh, has never received proper credit for his, for his, uh, his acumen. But uh, one of the things that was going on during World War II, and it's important to realize here, is that Chiang Kai-shek had absolutely no intention whatsoever to fight the Japanese. Um, in the north, in the northern provinces of China, of course, again, as was true in France, and in Italy, um, the communists were the ones who were actively fighting the, the Japanese. Now, the Japanese occupation of China had been particularly repressive, even by Japanese standards, and it had been going on since uh, for two years before the war in Europe had even started. Um, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek, however, was so terrified, or not terror, he was so, well, yeah, he was so terrified of the communist opposition, which had a lot of support among the people of the country, whereas Chiang Kai-shek had support only of uh, the military, uh, the foreign bank, Bankers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was so frightened that he let um, he would rather do anything than actually waste any of his own his own weapons or resources fighting the Japanese. What he did for all of World War II was to stand around and tell the United States essentially to keep sending him money so he could fight the Japanese and use that to stockpile weapons against the communists, while the communists in the north were fighting the Japanese with hoes and shovels and rifles. Now, because of this fact, um, the entire Chiang Kai-shek government was geared to one concept only, and that was to make a pile of money, to outlast the war, and then, with U.S. help, consolidate themselves. But there was always the possibility that, they, that the government would fall through, so, like, so, again, the first priority, making money, became very important. And the drain of U.S. funds and others from the, the treasuries of the Kuomintang were phenomenal. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars sucked out of the, uh, the uh, Lend-Lease East agreements and going directly into the pockets of, Ameri of, uh, of Chinese officials. So this is one of the things that was going on with Tai Li and uh, Chiang Kai-shek. These people were not leaders of a government in the common sense. These were people who had a golden goose and they were going to wring every last egg out of it while they had the opportunity before the people in China rose up on Moss, which they did, and threw them out on their ear. Now, because of the fact that uh, General Stilwell wanted Chiang Kai-shek to fight the Japanese, 
he uh, was at odds with Chiang Kai-shek, whom he couldn't stand, and the feeling was mutual. Eventually, General Stilwell was replaced by someone whose political sympathies were much, much more closely in tune with those of Chiang Kai-shek, and that's a fellow we've looked at in the past, namely General Albert Cody Wiedemeyer. Wiedemeyer's education, his, his military education, could be accurately described as Nazi, inasmuch as he was a graduate of the Kriegswehr Academy, the German West Point, in essence. Uh, we looked at him at considerable length in Radio Free America show number 11. Also, uh, we touched uh, back on uh, General Wiedemeyer in Radio Free America number 14. But Wiedemeyer himself had an extraordinary number of uh, fascist connections. Uh, he rented his apartment from Gerhard Rossbach, a leader of the stormtroopers who later went to work for the CIA. He was a close friend of Ludwig Beck, chief of the German general staff. And in fact, in his own uh, biography, his own autobiography, Wiedemeyer reports, Wiedemeyer comments that he was even known around the Kriegswehr Academy for being uh, a, 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 an enthusiastic Sieg Heiler. So uh, we, we looked at Wiedemeyer at, at great length, again, in Radio Free America show number 14, including his probable participation in the assassination, well, actually, his definite participation in the assassination of President Kennedy, according to the Sidisi, the French Military Intelligence Service. Eventually, Wiedemeyer, again, much more closely in tune with the dyed in the wool anti-communist sentiments of Chiang Kai-shek, replaces General Stilwell. It's worth noting that, uh, that when Wiedemeyer becomes American commander in China and advisor to Chiang Kai-shek, Wiedemeyer centralized all intelligence operations in China under his command. However, one of the stipulations was to be that all covert activities had to be cleared by both the American army and the Chinese government. And as we're about to see, that placed one of, that placed Tai Li through one of his closest aides in a position to veto any intelligence operation that he disagreed with. Now, this is significant uh, because one of the, the interesting aspects of Tai Li and the whole Kuomintang uh, axis was that at times they would actually collaborate with the Japanese against the Chinese. And uh, OSS eventually wound up, wound up at severe loggerheads with the Tai Li organization, even though they technically formed an alliance with them, because of the fact that Tai Li would not permit OSS to function in connection with the Chinese communists. Now, the Chinese communists were the most effective fighting force against the Japanese in China. As such, OSS wanted to uh, give them the necessary logistical support to do the job and basically save American lives by pinning down ja and killing Japanese troops. This was totally opposed by Chiang Kai-shek, and in fact, the OSS was convinced that Tai Li's organization was murdering their own Chinese agents who attempted to uh, effect liaison with the communists, although they weren't able to prove this. The British actually came much closer to proving that, and the British uh, actually sent aides, sent agents into China to spy on Tai Li, who they felt had German sympathies. Incidentally, one of the things we also looked at in uh, Radio Free America show number 11 was the fact that after Tai Li was killed in a plane crash, the head of Chiang Kai-shek's military intelligence was headed up by, well, the, the head of that became a man named Louis Siefkin, who formerly was a Nazi spy who'd helped transmit intelligence on Pearl Harbor to the Japanese, facilitating their attack on Pearl Harbor. At any rate, though, it's worth noting that after General Wiedemeyer, and a background on him again in Radio Free America number 11, after Wiedemeyer assumes control of the, the American military situation in China, he cements American, uh, American military intelligence operations to the organization of Tai Li. In other words, the Tai Li organization now has veto power over any intelligence operation in the area. And one last thing, just to remind you, the foundation of the Tai Li organization is the heroin-dealing Green Gang. Right. Again, Tai Li is the person over to Yue Sheng and the Green Gang, although the Green Gang represents the core of Tai Li's organization. Continuing now but from OSS by R. Harris Smith. But Wiedemeyer had a further proviso for clandestine operations. He centralized all planning for secret services at his headquarters and insisted that future covert activities be cleared, unquote, by both the American Army and the Chinese government. To represent the Generalissimo in the clearance machinery, the Chinese government appointed a general who was actually one of Tai Li's closest aides. OSS thus met with official Chinese objections whenever an operation requiring communist cooperation was proposed. In February of 1945, a contingent of Jedbergs, by the way, those were commandos who'd worked behind the lines in Europe, a contingent of Jedbergs was flown to China for commando operations. Upon their departure from the United States, they were told that they would be working with communist guerrillas, as many of them had done in France. But the Jeds never reached North China. Neither did an OSS team organize to direct and actually operate an entire military communications network for the communists. The unit, commanded by Frank Farrell, a New York newspaper editor in Marine uniform, waited impatiently at OSS headquarters in Kunming throughout the spring of 1945. The central government refused to sanction the mission. 
Tai Li and Miles continued to charge that OSS was collaborating with Yinan. Interrupting, Yinan was the communist Chinese capital during World War II. In July, Miles claimed that OSS had dropped submachine guns to communist plainclothesmen, unquote, at Shanghai. The point here now is that uh, the Tai Li organization is bound even more closely to the American commitment in China, even though that commitment was actually, in, in as far as its effectiveness against the Japanese was concerned, was compromised by this very alliance. Even General Wiedemeyer himself, and his political sympathies could accurately be described as fascist, uh, General Wiedemeyer himself uh, spoke very highly, although he was m militantly anti-communist, in his own writings he spoke very highly of the military performance of the Chinese communists, and while the war was still going on, did what he could to try and work with those Chinese communists. But, but Tai Li himself and his organization would not permit this. So it's worth noting here that this alliance actually cost American lives because the Japanese even until quite late in the war, enjoyed good military success in China, simply due mo to the fact that the Kuomintang was not interested in fighting the Japanese. A lot of Americans lost their lives as a result of that. Going to read one last short segment, and then we're going to take a break and give you a chance to get up and stretch a little bit. This is from The Great Heroine Coup, again by Henry Kruger. And he's writing, again, in sort of a more an overview of what some of the results of these things were. Uh, again, he's talking about 1948 at this point. Meanwhile, in the United States, KMT agents helped establish a powerful China lobby and collaborated with friends and U.S. agencies to target, and in some cases drive from the government, old foes of the former U.S. KMT Tai Li alliance, including those inside the OSS. Um, before I finish this segment, let me just mention real quickly, you hear the China lobby a lot. The China lobby was a group composed of a variety of uh, mostly right-wing Americans and Chinese. Um, the Chinese, most of them directly out of the Chiang Kai-shek government. The leader of the, chi of the China lobby was in many ways, well, besides Henry Luce of Time Magazine, also General Claire Chenault, a very close friend of the Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, it was the China lobby, in fact, and the, the uh, accusations of the China lobby that people in the State Department had given China away to the communists, um, uh, an accusation that any reasonable historian would laugh at because the Chiang Kai-shek government was so far from being an actual government, it was laughable. Um, but it was those accusations by the China lobby against uh, various members of the State Department and the Foreign Service that actually started the McCarthy era in the United States and the allegations of communist uh, subversion within the government. We looked at the China lobby again in Radio Free America show number 11. We looked at part of its origins. We repeated that in Radio Free America number 14 about the World Anti-Communist League. In general, uh, Radio Free America's 14 and 15 dealing with the World Anti-Communist League will, will flesh out your understanding of the China lobby. All right, so I'll start that again. Meanwhile, in the United States, meaning meanwhile 1948, KMT agents helped establish a powerful China lobby and collaborated with friends and U.S. agencies to target and in some cases drive from government old foes of the former U.S. KMT Tai Li alliance, including those inside the OSS. Okay, so the China lobby is getting together to drive the people opposed to the drug smugglers out of office. A scholarly book in 1960 noted that, quote, the narcotics business has been a factor in some activities and permutations of the China lobby, unquote, thus challenging the official narcotics bureau myth that KMT dope in this country was, quote, communist Chinese, unquote. So again, what we see in this case, um, not only the, the, the combining of the, uh, the, the reactionary or the right wing or the extreme conservative factions in, in political circles with the intelligence and in many cases the actual uh, dope runners and warlords um, to, to uh, chase from government or slander people who are opposed to these kinds of policies. But on top of that, we see again that, uh, as, as Adolf Hitler once put it, that impudent reversal of truth in which uh, the, the pot calls the kettle black. And that is exactly what was going on with the China lobby and their allegations of communist Chinese dope flooding the American mainland. We're going to be taking a musical break now. When we come back, we're going to look at a, an expansion or a further development of the cooperation between the dope-dealing Kuomintang and U.S. intelligence, and we're going to look at the role of the CIA and the Kuomintang in setting up the so-called Golden Triangle, which, uh, after the poppy fields in Turkey began to decline due to pressure from some of the Western nations, the Golden Triangle became the primary heroin production wor uh, area in the entire world for a long time, supplied the U.S. market. The rise of the Golden Triangle was inextricably linked with the Kuomintang and its support from the CIA, and we're going to look at that when we come back. 
and we will be coming back. But first, we're going to take a short break. Stick with us. Get up, stretch a little bit, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes with more of Radio Free America right here on KFJC. Radio Free America broadcast of, well, it's actually about the 24th Radio Free America, but it's the first broadcast specifically devoted to drugs and the American intelligence establishment. Although, as we have seen so far already, the American intelligence establishment includes uh, largely large other factors in the American political establishment, including the military and uh, other branches of the, uh, the the legislative and executive branches. And also, it includes many foreign intelligence branches, which we're going to be getting into as well. What we've just been talking about at some length is a, a particular foreign intelligence service, um, the notorious Gomendang Intelligence Service under General Tai Lee. And as uh, to put it in a nutshell, we've been talking about the fact that Tai Li, in putting together his intelligence force for Chiang Kai-shek um, in China, uh, co-opted the entire Green Gang, which was a gang of uh, terrorists, kidnappers, thieves, and most specifically important for our purpose, drug dealers, and took it over and then linked his organization up with American intelligence. Okay, now the cooperation between the CIA and Kuomintang elements, and recall that Kuomintang inextricably linked with dope-dealing syndicates, which it used as an anti-communist cadre in much the same way that the OSS and CIA used the, the mafia and the union course, the, uh, the link-up between U.S. intelligence and the Kuomintang inextricably involved in the dope traffic, as we're going to see now, uh, th this pattern has continued to operate, I should say, continued to operate historically and was to result in the development of the so-called Golden Triangle area of Southeast Asia as a primary heroin or opium growing center. The Golden Triangle generally refers to an area of Laos, Thailand, and Burma, which uh, came to the forefront of the narcotics trafficking during the Vietnam War. And the... the the traffic in Southeast Asia is what we're going to be looking at right now, and the CIA Kuomintang cooperation in promoting it is front and center. Returning once again to the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. While the work of French clandestine services in Indochina enabled the opium trade to survive a government repression campaign, some CIA activities in Burma helped transform the Shan states from a relatively minor poppy cultivating area into the largest opium growing region in the world. The precipitous collapse of the nationalist Chinese Kuomintang or KMT government in 1949 convinced the Truman administration that it had to stem, quote, the southward flow of communism, unquote, into Southeast Asia. In 1950, the Defense Department extended military aid to the French in Indochina. In that same year, the CIA began regrouping those remnants of the defeated Kuomintang army in the Burmese Shan states for a projected invasion of southern China. Although the Kuomintang army was to fail in its military operations, it succeeded in monopolizing and expanding the Shan state's opium trade. The Kuomintang shipped bountiful harvests to northern Thailand, where they were sold to General Fao Sirianonda of the Thai police, a CIA client. The CIA had promoted the Fao Kuomintang partnership in order to provide a secure rear area for the Kuomintang, but this alliance soon became a critical factor in the growth of Southeast Asia's narcotics traffic. With CIA support, the Kuomintang remained in Burma until 1961 when a Burmese army offensive drove them into Laos and Thailand. By this time, however, the Kuomintang had already used their control over the tribal populations to expand Shan State opium production by almost a thousand percent, from less than 40 tons after World War II to an estimated 300 to 400 tons by 1962. From bases in northern Thailand, the Kuomintang have continued to send huge mule caravans into the Shan states to bring out the opium harvest. Today, over 20 years after the CIA first began supporting Kuomintang troops in the Golden Triangle region, these Kuomintang caravans control almost a third of the world's total illicit opium supply and have a growing share of Southeast Asia's thriving heroin business. All right, continuing with the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. Nationalist Chinese stragglers began crossing into Burma in late 1949. And in January 1950, remnants of the 93rd Division, 26th Army, and General Li Mi's 8th Army arrived in Burma. 5,000 of General Li Mi's troops who crossed into, Indo, uh, crossed into Indochina instead of Burma were quickly disarmed by the French and interned on Fu Quoc Island in the Gulf of Thailand until they were repatriated to Taiwan in June 1953. By the way, this general we're talking about is L-I-M-I, -I, not to be confused with Tai Li, who we were talking about earlier. Good point. However, the Burmese army was less successful than the French in dealing with the Chinese. 
By March 1950, some 1,500 Ken, uh, KMT troops had crossed the border and were occupying territory between Kengtung City and Tachilek. In June, the Burmese army commander for Kengtung State demanded that the KMT either surrender or leave Burma immediately. When General Li Mi refused, the Burmese army launched a drive from Kengtung City and captured Tachilek in a matter of weeks. 200 of Li Mi's troops fled to Laos and were interned, but the remainder retreated to Mong Sat, about 40 miles west of Tachilek and 15 miles from the Thai border. Since the Burmese army had been tied down for three years in central Burma, battling four major rebellions, its King Tung contingent was too weak to pursue the KMT through the mountains to Mong Sat. But it seemed only a matter of months until the Burmese troops would become available for the final assault on the weakened KMT forces. At this point, the CIA entered the lists on the side of the KMT, drastically altering the balance of power. The Truman administration, ambivalent toward the conflict in Southeast Asia since it took office in 1945, was shocked into action by the sudden collapse of Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang regime. All the government agencies scrambled to devise policies, quote, to block further communist expansion in Asia, unquote. And in April 1950, the Joint Chiefs of Staff advised the Secretary of Defense that, quote, resolution of the situation facing Southeast Asia would be facilitated if prompt and continuing measures were undertaken to reduce the pressure from communist China. In this connection, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have noted the evidence of renewed vitality and apparent increased effectiveness of the Chinese nationalist forces. They went on to suggest the implementation of, quote, a program of special covert operations designed to interfere with communist activities in Southeast Asia, unquote. The exact details of the special covert operations planned for Burma were not spelled out in the Joint Chiefs of Staff memo or any of the other Pentagon papers because it was one of the most heavily classified operations ever undertaken by the CIA. The U.S. ambassador to Burma was not told. Top-ranking officials in the State Department were kept in the dark, and it was even hidden from the CIA's own deputy director for intelligence. From what can be gleaned from available documents and the events themselves, it seems that the Truman administration feared that Mao was bent on the conquest of Southeast Asia and would continually probe at China's southern frontier for an opening for his, quote, invading hordes. Although the Truman administration was confident that Indochina could be held against a frontal assault, there was concern that Burma might be the hole in the anti-communist dike. Couldn't Mao make an end run through Burma, sweep across Thailand, and attack Indochina from the rear? The apparent solution was to arm the KMT remnants in Burma and use them to make the Burma-China borderlands, from Tibet to Thailand, an impenetrable barrier. The first signs of direct CIA aid to the KMT appeared in early 1951, when Burmese intelligence officers reported that unmarked C-46 and C-47 transport aircraft were making at least five parachute drops a week to KMT forces in Mong Sat. With its new supplies, the KMT underwent a period of vigorous expansion and reorganization. Training bases staffed with instructors flown in from Taiwan were constructed near Mong Sat, KMT agents scoured the Kokang and Wa states along the Burma-China border for scattered KMT survivors, and General Li Mi's force burgeoned to 4,000 men. In April 1950, Li Mi led the bulk of his force up the Salween River to Mong Mao in the Wa states, where they established a base camp near the China border. As more stragglers were rounded up, a new base camp was opened at Mong Yang. Soon unmarked C-47s were seen making airdrops in the area. When Li Mi recruited 300 troops from Kokang State under the command of the Sabwa's younger sister, Olive Yang, more arms were again dropped to the KMT camp. So we have the CIA arming the Kuomintang refugees in Burma, ostensibly to go after the Chinese communists and to present a barrier against a possible Chinese, uh, communist Chinese invasion of Southeast Asia. Well, as we've seen, uh, well, as we know from history, that invasion never took place. It's worth noting that the CIA's aid to the Kuomintang forces in Burma was instrumental in permitting the Kuomintang forces, and we've looked at Kuomintang, official Kuomintang involvement with uh, the opium trade in the past, or earlier in the broadcast, I should say, this CIA aid to the Kuomintang forces in Burma permitted them to take over and expand the opium trade, the opium growing in the Shan states, a uh, disputed uh, area of Burma, continuing with the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. With the Burmese army still preoccupied with insurgency in other parts of Burma, 
The Kuomintang soon became the only effective government in all the Shan state's territories between the Salween River and the China border, Kokang, Hua, and Kengtung states. These territories were also Burma's major opium-producing region, and the shift in Kuomintang tactics allowed them to increase their control of the region's opium traffic. The Burmese government reported, quote, the Kuomintangs took over the control and administration of circles and village tracts. Circles, by the way, means districts. They started opening up revenue collection centers, and local people were being subjected to pay gate fees and ferry fees in entering their occupied area. Customs duties were also leveled on all commodities brought into their territories for trade. The taxes were collected in kind as well as money. By means of threat and coercion, these Kuomintang aggressors forced the local inhabitants to comply with their demands. The Kuomintang occupation centralized the marketing structure using hundreds of petty opium traders who, co who combed the Shan highlands. The Kuomintang also required that every hill tribe farmer pay an annual opium tax. One American missionary to the Lehu tribesmen of Kangtung State, Reverend Paul Lewis, recalls that the Kuomintang tax produced a dramatic rise in the amount of opium grown in the highland villages he visited. Tribes had very little choice in the matter, and he can still remember only too vividly the agony of the Lehu who were tortured by the Kuomintang for failure for failing to comply with the regulations. Moreover, many Chinese soldiers married Lehu tribeswomen. These marriages reinforced Kuomintang control over the highlands and made it easier for them to secure opium and recruits. Through their personal contact in mountain villages, their powerful army, and their control over the opium-growing regions, the Kuomintang were in an ideal position to force an expansion of the Shan state's opium production when Yunnan's illicit production began to disappear in the early 1950s. Almost all the Kuomintang opium was sent south to Thailand, either by mule train or aircraft. Soon after their arrival in Burma, the Kuomintang formed a mountain transport unit recruiting local mule drivers and their animals. Since most of their munitions and supplies were hauled overland from Thailand, the Kuomintang mule caravans found it convenient to haul opium on the outgoing trip from Mong Sot and soon developed a regular caravan trade with Thailand. Burmese military sources claimed that much of the Kuomintang opium was flown from Mong Sot in unmarked C-47s flying to Thailand and Taiwan. Of course, the implication here is that those unmarked C-47s were CIA planes. We're going to look at later in the broadcast the role of Air America, a CIA air proprietary in flying opium from Laos into Vietnam. Continuing here with, with uh, McCoy's account. In any case, once the Kuomintang opium left Mong Sot, it was usually shipped to Chiang Mai, where a Kuomintang colonel maintained a liaison office with the Nationalist Chinese consulate and with local Thai authorities. Posing as ordinary Chinese merchants, the colonel and his staff used raw opium to pay for the, for the munitions, food, and clothing that arrived from Bangkok at the Chiang Mai railhead. Once the material was paid for, it was this colonel's responsibility to forward it to Mong Sot. Usually, the Kuomintang dealt with the commander of the Thai police, General Fao, who shipped the opium from Chiang Mai to Bangkok for both local consumption and export. While the three CIA-sponsored invasions of Yunnan at least represented a feebly conceived anti-communist policy, the next move defied all logic. With what appeared to be CIA support, the Kuomintang began a full-scale invasion of eastern Burma. In late 1952, thousands of Kuomintang mercenaries forded the Salween River and began a well-orchestrated advance. The Burmese government claimed that this was the beginning of an attempt to conquer the entire country. But in March of 1953, the Burmese fielded three crack brigades and quickly drove them back across the Salween. Interestingly, after a skirmish with the Kuomintang at the Wan Sa La Ferry, Burmese soldiers discovered the bodies of three white men who bore no identification other than some personal letters with Washington and New York addresses. So here we not only have the CIA aiding the Kuomintang and providing them with the necessary muscle to control and expand the Burmese opium trade, thereby carrying it through their caravans into Thailand as well, where a lot of it was marketed. But apparently, in 1952, the CIA actually began aiding the Kuomintang in an operation against Burma, according to the Burmese, with the aid of taking over the entire country. And as we will see, there was no lack of knowledge of this, as a matter of fact, as we'll see in the end of the next segment. And as by 1952, articles were being printed in the New York Times detailing the fact that these activities were going on. So there was no, there's no excuse of, uh, of ignorance on the part of American officials. Anyway, continuing with a, a slightly uh, later section uh, in the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia. 
Although forgotten by the international press, the Kuomintang guerrilla operations continue to create problems for both the Burmese and Chinese governments. When delegations from the Union of Burma and the People's Republic of China met to resolve a border dispute in the summer of 1960, they also concluded a secret agreement for combined operations against the KMT base at Mong Pa Liao. This base, with a runway capable of handling the largest transport aircraft, was defended by some 10,000 Kuomintang troops entrenched in an elaborate fortifications complex. After weeks of heavy fighting, 5,000 Burmese troops and three full People's Liberation Army divisions totaling 20,000 men finally overwhelmed the fortress on January 26, 1961. While many of their hill tribe recruits fled into the mountains, the crack KMT units recruited, re retreated across the Mekong River into northwestern Laos. Burmese officers were outraged to discover American arms of recent manufacture and five tons of ammunition bearing distinctive red, white, and blue labels. In Rangoon, 10,000 angry demonstrators marched in front of the U.S. Embassy, and Burma sent a note of protest to the United States saying that, quote, large quantities of modern military equipment, mainly of American origin, have been captured by Burmese forces, unquote. State Department officials in Washington disclaimed any responsibility for the arms and promised appropriate action against Taiwan if investigations showed that its military aid shipments had been diverted to Burma. Another round of airlifts to Taiwan began. On April 5th, Taiwan announced the end of the flights, declaring that 4,200 soldiers had been repatriated. Six days later, Taiwan joined the State Department in disavowing any responsibility for the 6,000 remaining troops. However, within months, the CIA began hiring these disowned Kuomintang remnants as mercenaries for its secret operations in northwestern Laos. Let me read that again to you. Within months, the CIA began hiring these disowned Kuomintang remnants as mercenaries for its secret operations in northwestern Laos. At first glance, the history of the Kuomintang's involvement in the Burmese opium trade seems to be just another case of a CIA client taking advantage of the agency's political protection to enrich itself from the narcotics trade. But upon closer examination, the CIA appears to be much more seriously compromised in this affair. The CIA fostered the growth of the Yunnan Province Anti-Communist National Salvation Army in the borderlands of northeastern Burma, a potentially rich opium-growing region. There is no question of CIA ignorance or naivete. For as early as 1952, the New York Times and other major American newspapers published detailed accounts of the KMT role in the narcotics trade. But most disturbing of all is the coincidence that the Kuomintang's Bangkok connection, the commander of the Thai police, General Phao, P-H-A-O, was the CIA's man in Thailand. Still more about General Phao appears in McCoy's book. Continuing. There can be little doubt that the CIA support was an invaluable asset to General Fow in managing the opium traffic. The agency supplied the aircraft, motor vehicles, and naval vessels that gave Fow the logistic capability to move opium from the poppy fields to the sea lanes. And his role in protecting sea supplies shipments to the Kuomintang no doubt gave Fow a considerable advantage in establishing himself as the exclusive exporter of Kuomintang opium. By the way, sea supply was a CIA proprietary set up by a CIA agent named Paul Hellowell that was operating in, in conjunction with Kuomintang. You may want to start this over again because I want to mention broadcasting from Foothill College. This is KFJC, Los Altos Hills. Right. Now, uh, uh, recapping what we just looked at, we looked at how basically the military muscle provided to the Kuomintang exiles in Burma by CIA enabled them to take over the Burmese opium trade and expand it. This opium trade was used to provide them with the necessary income to support their uh, mercenary army in Burma. This mercenary army not only operated against communist China, which it was supposed to, it also began operating against Burma in an attempt to take over Burma entirely and apparently did so with CIA support. And eventually, of course, this CIA-strengthened uh, Kuomintang group in Burma began shipping, shipping opium on a regular basis to Thailand, and their primary contact there was the CIA's man in Thailand, General Fao. Okay, now, uh, re resuming once again this section of the politics of heroin in Southeast Asia, there can be little doubt that the CIA's support was an invaluable asset to General Fao in managing the opium traffic. The agency supplied the aircraft, motor vehicles, and naval vessels that gave Fowl the logistic capability to move opium from the poppy fields to the sea lanes. 
and his role in protecting sea supplies shipments to the Kuomintang no doubt gave Fowler a considerable advantage in establishing himself as the exclusive exporter of Kuomintang opium. And recall again, sea supply, a CIA proprietary. Resuming the narrative. Given its even greater involvement in the Kuomintang's Shan State's opium commerce, how do we evaluate the CIA's role in the evolution of large-scale opium trafficking in the Burma-Thailand region? Under the Kennedy administration, presidential advisor Walt W. Rostow popularized a doctrine of economic development that preached that a stagnant, underdeveloped economy could be jarred into a period of rapid growth, an economic takeoff, unquote, by a massive injection of foreign aid and capital which could then be withdrawn as the economy coasted into a period of self-sustained growth. CIA's support for FAO and the Kuomintang seems to have sparked such a takeoff, unquote, in the Burma-Thailand opium trade during the 1950s. Modern aircraft replaced mules, naval vessels replaced sampans, and well-trained military organizations expropriated the traffic from bands of illiterate mountain traders. Never before had the Shan states encountered smugglers with the discipline, technology, and ruthlessness of the Kuomintang. Under General Fao's leadership, Thailand had changed from, had changed from an opium-consuming nation to the world's most important opium distribution center. The Golden Triangle's opium production approached its present scale. Burma's total harvest had increased from less than 40 tons just before World War II to 300 to 400 tons in 1962, with Thailand's expanded at an even greater rate from 7 tons to over 100 tons. In a 1970 report, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics concluded, quote, By the end of the 1950s, Burma, Laos, and Thailand together had become a massive producer and the source of more than half the world's present illicit supply of 1,250 to 14,000 tons annually. Moreover, with this increase in output, the region of the Far East and Southeast Asia quickly became self-sufficient in opium. But was this increase in opium production the result of a conscious decision by the CIA to support its allies FAO and the Kuomintang through the narcotics traffic? Was this the CIA's Operation X? Interrupting, we'll look at Operation X presently. There can be no doubt that the CIA knew its allies were heavily involved in the traffic. Headlines made it known throughout, headlines made it known to the whole world, and FAO was responsible for Thailand's censure by the UN's Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Certainly, the CIA did nothing to halt the trade or to prevent its aid from being abused. But whether the CIA actively organized the traffic is something only the agency itself can answer. In any case, by the early 1960s, the Golden Triangle had become the largest single opium-growing region in the world, a vast reservoir able to supply America's lucrative markets should any difficulties arise in the Mediterranean heroin complex. The Golden Triangle had surplus opium, it had well-protected, disciplined syndicates. With the right set of circumstances, it could easily become a major's, America's major heroin supplier. And those circumstances were soon to develop. So again, we've taken a look at uh, the role of the CIA in promoting the Kuomintang's uh, exile armies in the Golden Triangle in Burma, Laos, and Thailand, in promoting the, in, in uh, raising the Golden Triangle into one of the major opium production centers in the entire world. As McCoy indicates in that section, it's unclear whether this was a result of conscious CIA policy, although uh, in light of events that we're going to be covering in future broadcasts, that's a possibility that can't be ruled out. The point is that so far, we've taken a look at CIA anti-communist counterinsurgency programs and cooperative programs with organized crime syndicates in Sicily, Corsica, and in China, and uh, we've looked at how these resulted in the dominant post-war uh, opium production centers and heroin importing uh, networks. We've looked at how the Sicilian Mafia was restored to power, and in return, the uh, and in turn, Sicilian Mafia cooperates with Corsican Syndica, which also gets its ne Corsican Syndica, which gets its necessary muscle also from CIA. That becomes the French connection. We then look at uh, we then took a look at how the Kuomintang began working with the uh, with U.S. intelligence. Kuomintang, in turn, relying heavily on a dope on a dope syndicate run by Tu Yuisheng and Tai Li. This Kuomintang U.S. intelligence relationship continues with the Kuomintang, Kuomintang exile army in Burma receiving heavy CIA support, using that increased muscle to not only control the Shan state's opium traffic, but to expand it greatly and to turn that region into one of the dominant opium producing regions in the world. And as we've seen, the Kuomintang forces in Burma work very closely, and therefore their traffic is moved by General Fao of Thailand, the CIA's man in Thailand. Now, we talked earlier in the broadcast about how 
heroin and uh, well, or Ill illicit narcotics in general uh, become a political tool uh, in in the way that they can supply money for clandestine operations. Uh, we're going to look now at how heroin became one of the major factors in Vietnam, even predating the American presence in Vietnam, and how the idea of heroin as a major uh, gain of political uh, and actual uh, economic capital uh, came to be. Reading again from uh, Alfred McCoy's book, The Politics of Heroin, etc., etc. They're talking again about Vietnam. The French suffered through several years of frustrating stalemate before realizing that their application of classical textbook precepts was losing the war. Um, by the way, just mentioning, this is the war taking place after World War II in Vietnam, where the French, uh, the, the Vietnamese, who again had fought as uh, as resistance troops to the Japanese, fully expected to be granted their independence. And instead, uh, due to some deals cut between uh, within the, the groups of the Allies, uh, most notably between the French and English in the United States, the French were handed back their colonial possession of Vietnam. But as the French were to find out, things had changed and would never be the same again. Uh, so the French suffered through this uh, several years of frustrating stalemate before realizing their application of, of textbook precepts was losing the war. But they slowly developed a new strategy of counter-guerrilla or counter-insurgency warfare. By 1950 to 1951, younger, innovative French officers had abandoned the conventional war precepts that essentially visualized Indochina as a depopulated staging ground for fortified lines, massive sweeps, and flanking maneuvers. Instead, Indochina became a vast chessboard where hill tribes, bandits, and religious minorities could be used as pawns to hold certain territories and pre prevent Viet Minh infiltration. Uh, the Viet Minh were the, were the precursors to what we knew as the Viet Cong. The French concluded formal alliances with a number of these ethnic or religious factions and supplied them with arms and money to keep the Viet Minh out of their area. The French hope was to atomize the Viet Minh's mobilized, unified mass into a mosaic of autonomous fiefs hostile to the revolutionary movement. Major Roger Tranquier and Captain Antoine Savani were the most important apostles of this new military doctrine. Captain Savani secured portions of Cochin, China, comprising Saigon and the Mekong Delta, by rallying river pirates, Catholics, and messianic religious cults to the French side. Along the spine of the Annamite Mountains from the Central Highlands to the China border, Major Tranquier recruited an incredible variety of hill tribes. By 1954, more than 40,000 tribal mercenaries were busy ambushing Viet Minh supply lines, safeguarding territory, and providing intelligence. Other French officers organized Catholic militia from parishes in the Tonkin Delta, Nung pirates on the Tonkin Gulf, and a Catholic militia in Hue. Although the French euphemistically referred to these local troops as, quote, supplementary forces and attempted to legitimize their leaders with ranks, commissions, and military decorations, they were little more than mercenaries, and very greedy, very expensive mercenaries at that. Uh, to ensure the loyalty of the Bin Zayan river pirates who guarded Zaigon, the French allowed them to organize a variety of lucrative criminal enterprises and paid them an annual stipend of $85,000 as well. Tranquier may have had 40,000 hill tribe guerrillas under his command by 1954, but he also had to pay dearly for their services. He needed an initial outlay of $15,000 for basic training, arms, and bonuses to set up each mercenary unit of 150 men. It is no exaggeration to say that the success of Savani's and Tanquier's work depended almost entirely on adequate financing. If they were well-funded, they could expand their programs almost indefinitely. But without capital, they could not even begin. But the counterinsurgency efforts were continually plagued by a lack of money. The war was tremendously unpopular in France, and the French National Assembly reduced its outlay to barely enough for the regular military units, leaving almost nothing for extras such as paramilitary or intelligence work. Moreover, the high command itself never really approved of the younger generation's unconventional approach and were unwilling to divert scarce funds from the regular units. Tranquier still complains that the high command never understood what he was trying to do, and says that they consistently refused to provide sufficient funds for his operations. The solution was Operation X, a clandestine narcotics traffic so secret that only high-ranking French and Vietnamese officials even knew of its existence. 
The anti-opium drive that began in 1946 received scant support from the, quote, Indochina hands. Custom, customs officials, by Indochina hands, they mean the people who've been there for a long time, the old French officials. Customs officials continued to purchase raw opium from the Mayo, that's a tribe, and the opium smoking dens, cosmetically renamed detoxification clinics, continued to sell unlimited quantities of opium. However, on September 3, 1948, the French High Commissioner announced that each smoker had to register with the government, submit to a medical examination to ascertain the degree of his addiction, and then be weaned of the habit by having his dosage gradually reduced. Statistically, the program was a success. The Customs Service had bought 60 tons of raw opium from the Mayo and Yao in 1943, but in 1951 they purchased almost nothing. The detoxification clinics, quote-unquote, were closed, and the hermetically sealed opium packets each addict purchased from the Customs Service contained a constantly dwindling amount of opium. But the opium trade remained essentially unchanged. The only real differences were that the government, having abandoned opium as a source of revenue, now faced serious budgetary problems. And the French intelligence community, having secretly taken over the opium trade, had all theirs solved. The opium monopoly had gone underground to become Operation X. We're going to look at more of how Operation X is financed, how Operation X was supervised right now. And the implication for this is, of course, that these very same tribesmen, when the U.S., took over the French role in Vietnam, these very same tribesmen then became instrumental in, in the so-called secret war in Laos. The Hmong or Mayo tribesmen became a key element of the CIA operation as well. We're going to look at that in just a second. Continuing now with some more discussion of Operation X. During its peak years from 1951 to 1954, Operation X was sanctioned down the highest levels by Colonel Bellu, B-E-L-L-E-U-X for S-D-E-C-E -E and General Raoul Salon for the Expeditionary Corps. Below them, Major Tronquier of M-A-C-G assured Operation X a steady supply of Mayo opium by ordering his liaison officers serving with Mayo Commander Tubi Lai Fung and Thai Federation Leader Deo Van Long to buy opium at a competitive price. Among the various French paramilitary agencies, the work of the Mixed Airborne Command Group, MACG, was most inextricably interwoven with the opium trade, and not only in order to finance operations. For its field officers in Laos and Tonkin had soon realized that unless they provided a regular outlet for the local opium production, the prosperity and loyalty of their hill tribe allies would be undermined. Once the opium was collected after the annual spring harvest, Tranquier had the mountain gorillas fly it to Captain Saint-Jacques Vang Tu near Saigon, where the Action Service School trained Hill Tribe mercenaries at a military base. There were no customs or police controls to interfere with or expose the illicit shipments here. From Cap Saint-Jacques, the opium was trucked the 60 miles into Saigon and turned over to the Binzuan bandits, who were there serving as the city's local militia and managing its opium traffic under the supervision of Captain Antoine Savani of the Duzien Bureau. The Binzuan, by the way, it's B-I-N-H-X-U-Y-E-N, the Binzuan operated two major opium boiling plants in Saigon, one near their headquarters at Cholon's Y Bridge and the other near the National Assembly to transform the raw poppy sap into a smokable form. The bandits distributed the prepared opium to dens and retail shops throughout Saigon and Cholon, some of which were owned by the Bin Zien. The others paid the gangsters a substantial share of their profits for protection. The Bin Zien divided its receipts with Tranquier's MACG and Savani's Duzien Bureau. Any surplus opium the Bin Zien were unable to market was sold to local Chinese merchants for export to Hong Kong or else to the Corsican criminal syndicates in Saigon for shipment to Marseille. MACG deposited its portion in a secret account managed by the Action Service Office in Saigon. When Tubi Lai Fung, that's T-O-U-B-Y-L-Y-F-O-U-N-G, or any other Mayo tribal leader needed money, he flew to Saigon and personally drew money out of the caisse noire, or black box. So, basically, the MACG, the Military Airborne Command Group, which was the... Uh, sort of patchwork quilt of local tribesmen put together by Major Tranquier and uh, which served as a mercenary army for the French in Vietnam was dependent in much the same way as the Kuomintang uh, CIA-supported forces in Burma were dependent on the opium traffic in order to finance their military operations. And again, this Operation X here represented a taking over 
in essence, of the opium trade in Southeast Asia or in Vietnam by French intelligence in order to finance its mercenary army, chiefly the Mayo tribesmen. The Mayo, or Hmong tribesmen as they're known, uh, I think they, they prefer to be known as the Hmong tribesmen, the male or Hmong tribesmen are opium farmers, and it was this opium crop which financed their military operations. And this is a pattern which was then to uh, reassert itself after the U.S. assumed the French role in Indochina. Talking a little bit about the changeover, and again, the United States first came into Vietnam uh, to help to try and bail the the, uh, the French out of the siege at Dien Bien Phu, and found themselves growing increasingly enmeshed in the uh, the political climate of Vietnam and to the uh, the doctrine of uh, of uh, facing off against the chi the communists the communists or communism which was conceived of as being a monolithic bloc um, wherever it might appear and as the French began to pull out the Americans began to ease into their place. Reading some more from The Politics of Heroin. When the French Expeditionary Corps began its rapid withdrawal from Indochina in 1955, MACG officers, remember that is the essentially the, the, the local mercenary troops put together by the French, MACG officers approached American military personnel and offered to turn over their entire paramilitary apparatus. CIA agent Lucien Conin was one of those contacted, and he passed the word along to Washington. But, quote, DOD, Department of Defense, responded that they wanted nothing to do with any French program, unquote, and the offer was refused. But many in the agency regretted the decision when the CIA sent Green Berets into Laos and Vietnam to organize Hill Tribe guerrillas several years later. And in 1962, American representatives visited Tranquier in Paris and offered him a high position as an advisor on mountain warfare in Indochina but fearing that the Americans would never give a French officer sufficient authority to accomplish anything, Tranquier refused. So right away, um, it, although as they mention here, that uh, that there was some dislocation between the MACG groups um, and, uh, and certain people in the Department of Defense not wanting to make those kinds of connections, as we will see, um, the uh, the rest of the the changeover was was remarkably smooth in terms of the uh, the old networks being picked up, and part of the old networks, as we know, uh, was Operation X, which was the the plan to use the heroin trade, the heroin trade that had been taken over by French military intelligence to turn the heroin trade into something that would benefit the anti-communist war effort. And as we shall see, uh, in fact, the U.S. government took this same heroin trade over themselves, um, entrusting it to their own hand-picked mercenaries, and used it for basically the same types of purposes. It, it should be noted here, just uh, perhaps in passing, that the old French colony of Indochina comprised what is today Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. That was all part of the same colony, so they, they were not separate countries in those days. However, of course, after the defeat of the French at Dien Bien Phu, they did become separate nations. Now, again, in Laos, the CIA then uh, picked up more or less where the French in Operation X left off. They began subsidizing the Hmong or Mayo tribesmen as a secret army that, in Laos to harass uh, Vietnamese supplies, North Vietnamese supplies, moving into what was then known as South Vietnam. Of the uh, American assumption of the French Operation X, in essence, or of the French mercenary uh, opium army in Laos, McCoy writes as follows. In Laos, CIA clandestine intervention produced changes and upheavals in the narcotics traffic. When political infighting among the Lao elite and escalating war forced the small Corsican charter airlines out of the opium business in 1965, the CIA's airline Air America began flying Mayo opium out of the hills to Long Chen, Long Cheng, and Vientiane. CIA cross-border intelligence missions into China from Laos reaped an unexpected dividend in 1962 when the Shan rebel leader who organized the forays for the agency began financing the Shan nationalist cause by selling Burmese opium to another CIA protege, Laotian General Fumi Nosavan, P-H-O-U-M-I, N-O-S-A-V-A-N. The economic alliance between General Fumi and the Shans opened up a new trading pattern that diverted increasingly significant quantities of Burmese opium from their normal marketplace in Bangkok. In the late 1960s, U.S. Air Force bombing disrupted Laotian opium production by forcing the majority of the Mayo opium farmers to become refugees. However, flourishing Laotian heroin laboratories, which are the major suppliers for the GI market in Vietnam, simply increased their imports of Burmese opium through already established trading relationships. 
The importance of these CIA clients in the subsequent growth of the Golden Triangle's heroin trade was revealed inadvertently by the agency itself when it leaked a classified report on the Southeast Asian opium traffic to the New York Times. The CIA analysis identified 21 opium refineries in the tri-border area where Burma, Thailand, and Laos converge and reported that seven were capable of producing 90 to 99 percent pure number four heroin. Of these seven heroin refineries, quote, the most important are located in the areas around Tachilek, Burma, Ban Huai Sai and Nem Kiong in Laos, and Mae Salong in Thailand. Although the CIA did not bother to mention it, many of these refineries are located in areas totally controlled by paramilitary groups closely identified with American military operations in the Golden Triangle area. Mae Salong is headquarters for the Nationalist Chinese Fifth Army, which has been continuously involved in CIA counterinsurgency and intelligence operations since 1950. According to a former CIA operative who worked in the area for a number of years, the heroin laboratory at Nam Kyung is protected by Major Chao La, C-H-A-O-L-A, commander of Yao mercenary troops for the CIA in northwestern Laos. One of the heroin laboratories near Ban Wai Se reportedly belongs to General Wane Ratikone, R-A-T-T-I-K-O-N-E, former commander-in-chief of the Royal Laotian Army, the only army in the world except for the U.S. Army, entirely financed by the U.S. government. The heroin factories near Tachilek are operated by Burmese paramilitary units and Shan rebel armies who control a relatively small percentage of Burma's narcotics traffic. Although few of these Shan groups have any relation to the CIA today, one of the most important chapters in the history of the Shan state's opium trade involves a Shan rebel army closely allied with the CIA. Other sources have revealed the existence of an important heroin laboratory operating in the Vientiane region under the protection of General Juan Ratikone. Finally, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics has report, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics has reported that General Vang Pao, commander of the CIA's secret army, has been operating a heroin refactory at Long Tiang, headquarters for CIA operations in northern Laos. So we see basically the same pattern that we saw under the French Operation X, holding firm when the CIA assumes stewardship of the, the Hmong or Mayo tribesmen. They are opium farmers. In order to keep fighting, their opium has to be sold. And one of the most disturbing things, and we're going to be developing this a little further, is how Air America, a CIA air proprietary, flew the opium from Laos into Vietnam. We're going to be going into just why it was being flown into Vietnam and what it was doing there after we take a short break. But it's worth noting here that Air America, a CIA air proprietary, very much, by the way, in the news right now, um, is was uh, flying this opium into Laos. And incidentally, Air America, and again, we're now talking October 16th, 1986, Air America is very much in the news recently because last week a an apparently CIA airplane including a gentleman named Eugene Hassenfuss, was shot down in Nicaragua. Hassenfuss, in addition to admitting he worked for U.S. intelligence, uh, revealed that he flew for Air America in Vietnam in the 60s. All right. Continuing and getting a little more into Air America and their uh, their co-option, if there is such a word, of the uh, the air traffic of, of uh, opium coming out of the Mayo tribesmen's regions, are also known as the Hmong, H-M-O-N-G. You've probably seen that. Um, and reading more from McCoy's book, wartime conditions had increased Mayo dependence on poppy cultivation, and the lack of air transport created serious economic problems for hill fighters, uh, for hill tribe opium farmers, excuse me. Since the CIA was using the Mayo population to combat Pathet Lao forces in the mountains of northeastern Laos, the Pathet Lao are the communist Laotian army, um, since the CIA was using the Mayo population to combat Pathet Lao forces in the mountains of northeastern Laos, the prosperity and well-being of this tribe was of paramount importance to the agency's success. By 1965, the CIA had created a Mayo army of 30,000 men that guarded radar installations vital to bombing North Vietnam, rescued downed American pilots, and battled Pathet Lao guerrillas. Without air transport for their opium, the Mayo faced economic ruin. There was simply no form of air transport available in northern Laos except the CIA's charter airline, Air America. And, according to several sources, Air America began flying opium from mountain villages north and east of the Plain of Jars to General Vang Pao's headquarters at Long Tien. Air America was known to be flying Mayo opium as late as 1971, 
Mayo Village leaders in the area west of the Plain of Jars, for example, claim that their 1970 and 71 opium harvests were bought up by Vang Pao's officers and flown to Longtian on Air America UH-1H Huey helicopters. This opium was probably destined for heroin laboratories in Longtian or Vientiane and ultimately for GI addicts in Vietnam. The U.S. Embassy in Vientiane adopted an attitude of benign neglect toward the opium traffic. When one American journalist wrote the embassy complaining that Laotian officials were involved in the drug trade, U.S. Ambassador G. McMurtry Godley responded in a letter dated December 2, 1970. Quote, Regarding your information about opium traffic between Laos and the United States, the purchase of opium in Southeast Asia is certainly less difficult than in other parts of the world. But I believe that the royal Laotian government takes its responsibility seriously to prohibit international opium traffic. However, latest information available to me indicated that all of Southeast Asia produces only 5% of narcotics, which are, unfortunately, illegally imported to Great Britain and the U.S., as you undoubtedly are already aware, our government is making every effort to contain this traffic, and I believe the Narcotics Bureau in Washington, D.C. can give you additional information if you have some other inquiries. But the latest information available to Ambassador Godley should have indicated that most of the heroin being used by American GIs in Vietnam was coming from Laotian laboratories. The exact location of Laos's most Laos's flourishing laboratories was common knowledge among even the most junior U.S. bureaucrats. Okay, so here we see, um, basically, the, the, the CIA has now gone from a, a, a slightly more passive role, or at least clandestine, more clandestine role in the heroin traffic, to direct intercession. The CIA has begun to fly opium out of the hills of Laos and hand it over to their puppet generals. Now, when the uh, Ambassador Godley um, uh, writes to uh, this uh, American journalist and says... Uh, uh, how does he put it? Um, our government is making every effort to contain this traffic. Uh, he perhaps was either being uh, cynical and sarcastic or he was uh, telling more truth than he knew. For as a matter of fact, the CIA was certainly doing its best to contain the traffic and had contained the traffic pretty thoroughly since they had a monopoly on the air transport of opium at that point. And bear in mind again, folks, while we're talking about this um, several years after the fact, these things are still going on. But in this case, most specifically, many of you um, out there either were in Vietnam, had relatives in Vietnam, sons, fathers, brothers, cousins, um, some of them came back with heroin habits. As a matter of fact, this is one of the things that caused the jump in heroin usage in the United States, was returning American soldiers. Specifically, the American addict population tripled as a result of Vietnam. Ultimately, the, her the opium traffic in Vietnam was being contained in the veins of American GIs. We're going to take a very short break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to give you some of the uh, background as to just how our troops wound up being addicted by the very, pe the very uh, people they were fighting to support and by the government who sent them there to fight in the first place. We'll be right back. Don't go away. We'll return with more of Radio Free America in just a moment on KFJC. <laughs> And we're back for the home stretch of tonight's Radio Free America. This is Nip Tuck with Dave Emery in the studios at KFJC. And we are just uh, into the final 25 minutes or so of tonight's broadcast. Uh, the first of at least three and possibly four, because as you can see, it's a massive story on uh, the collusion of uh, international intelligence and the international drug trade. And right now, we have just finished talking about um, a very important step when the CIA began, uh, stopped being just a clandestine behind-the-scenes manipulator of the drug traffic and the political gains attached thereto, and became, for the first time, at least as far as we can tell, an active full-time participant using a CIA a proprietary owned and operated airline, Air America, to bring the opium down out of the, Lau, the Laos Hills, the Mayo tribesmen's uh, opium uh, farms, and down and uh, giving them to the troops of General Vang Pao, who was a, essentially a CIA uh, pawn, I guess would be a nice way to put it. All right, tool perhaps. Tool, tool. Wh whatever, you know, a rose by any other name, or a poppy for that matter. That's right. Now, the, perhaps the most tragic aspect of the CIA's active involvement in the narcotics traffic in Southeast Asia was the fact that many of the victims of that traffic were the very troops 
who had been sent there in order to, to support the government of South Vietnam. As, as uh, indicated in the, in the passage that Nip read you just before the break, many, many GIs, and as I'm sure a great many of you are aware, a great many GIs became addicted to heroin in Vietnam, and their return to the United States after their tour of duty tripled the addict population of the United States. As we've indicated, uh, or as we've seen, that heroin was coming, was being grown by CIA allies in Laos, was coming out of Laos via the CIA and was being uh, transported in, into South Vietnam, and that main traffickers, as we're going to begin looking at in just a second, were key elements of the South Vietnamese government. Looking at the, uh, the heroin epidemic among American GIs in Vietnam, returning once again to the politics of heroin in, South Vietnam, uh, in Southeast Asia by Alfred McCoy. The sudden burst of heroin addiction among GIs in 1970 was the most important development in Southeast Asia's narcotics traffic since the region attained self-sufficiency in opium production in the late 1950s. By 1968-69, the Golden Triangle region was harvesting close to 1,000 tons of raw opium annually, exporting morphine-based to European heroin laboratories, and shipping substantial quantities of narcotics to Hong Kong both for local consumption and re-export to the United States. Although large amounts of chunky, low-grade number three heroin were being produced in Bangkok and the Golden Triangle for the local market, there were no laboratories anywhere in Southeast Asia capable of producing the fine-grained 80 to 99 percent pure number four heroin. However, in late 1969 and early 1970, Golden Triangle Laboratories added the final, dangerous ether precipitation process and convert in, converted to production of number four heroin. Many of the master chemists who supervised the conversion were Chinese, brought in specially from Hong Kong. In a June 1971 report, the CIA said that conversion from number three to number four heroin production in the Golden Triangle, quote, appears to be due to the sudden increase in demand by a large and relatively affluent market in South Vietnam, unquote. By mid-April 1971, demand for number four heroin both in Vietnam and the United States had increased so quickly that the wholesale price for a kilo jumped to $1,780 from $1,240 the previous September. Once large quantities of heroin became available to American GIs in Vietnam, heroin addiction spread like a plague. Previously non-existent in South Vietnam, suddenly number four heroin was everywhere. Fourteen-year-old girls were selling heroin at roadside stands on the main highway from Saigon to the U.S. Army base at Long Bin. Saigon street peddlers stuffed plastic vials of 95% pure heroin into the pockets of GIs as they strolled through downtown Saigon. And Mama Sans, or Vietnamese barracks maids, started carrying a few vials to work for sale to on-duty GIs. With this kind of aggressive sales campaign, the results were predictable. In September of 1970, Army medical officers questioned 3,103 soldiers of the AmeriCal Division and discovered that 11.9% had tried heroin since they came to Vietnam, and 6.6% were still using it on a regular basis. In November, a U.S. engineering battalion in the Mekong Delta reported that 14% of its troops were on heroin. By mid-1971, U.S. Army medical officers were estimating that about 10 to 15% or 25 to 37,000 of the lower-ranking enlisted men serving in Vietnam were heroin users. As base after base was overrun by these ant armies of heroin pushers with their identical plastic vials, GIs and officers alike started asking themselves why this was happening. Who was behind this heroin plague? The North Vietnamese were frequently blamed, and wild rumors started floating around U.S. installations about huge heroin factories in Hanoi, truck convoys rumbling down the Ho Chi Minh Trail loaded with cases of plastic vials, and heroin-crazed North Vietnamese regulars making suicide charges up the slopes of Khe San with syringes stuck in their arms. However, the U.S. Army Provost Marshal laid such rumors to rest in, in a 1971 report which said in part, quote, the opium-growing areas of North Vietnam are concentrated in mountainous northern provinces bordering China. Cultivation is closely controlled by the government, and none of the crop is believed to be channeled illicitly into international markets. Much of it is probably converted into morphine and used for medical purposes. Instead, the provost marshal accused high-ranking members of South Vietnam, Vietnam's government of being the top zone, unquote, in a four-tiered heroin-pushing pyramid. Zone 1 located at the top or apex of the pyramid, contains the financiers or backers of the illicit drug traffic in all its forms. The people comprising this group may be high-level, influential political figures, government leaders, or moneyed ethnic Chinese members of the criminal syndicates now flourishing in the Cholon section, the sector of the city of Saigon. The members comprising this group are the powers behind the scenes who can manipulate, foster, protect, and promote the illicit traffic in drugs. 
And uh, the again, the point being here that the American GIs were being addicted in Vietnam, and as we're about to look at now, one of the dominant forces in, in that addiction was none other than the elements of the very Vietnamese government those GIs were there to protect, primarily those around Nien Cao Ki. Nien Cao Ki was president of the Vietnamese Republic at one point, for a long time was vice president under Chu. He was also head of the Vietnamese Air Force, and in that capacity was able to insert himself right into the center of the narcotics traffic. As we shall see also, at this point, uh, the American military and political leaders in, in Vietnam, who were there instructing the forces in Vietnam, began to realize that they were, having, uh, were going to have real difficulty controlling the populace of South Vietnam. As we have said uh, the, many times, and many other people besides us have observed, uh, South Vietnam was not so much a nation as it was a group of people uh, receiving U.S. assistance in order to sort of stay in large groups and keep the North Vietnamese out, and even more importantly, keep the Viet Cong out, who are largely South Vietnamese. In other words, the people who who also lived in South Vietnam and who happened to be opposed to the government in Saigon. Um, this was becoming more and more an untenable position for the U.S. to support a government that had no popular support itself among its people, and more and more money and more and more... Uh, uh, underworld activity was needed to support this kind of effort to keep the populace under control. Now, it's worth noting that uh, Viet Cong activity in Saigon was increasing it uh, dramatically. In order to combat this, basically what the United States did was to reinstall a security system that had been largely operating under the French with Operation X. Basically, uh, the very same criminal syndicates that had figured prominently in the French security service, such as the Binzien River Pirates that we talked about, were repressed into service basically as, again, an anti communist cadre. The system that had been put together before and which had, you know, as far as it went, instituted uh, a very effective security in Saigon against the uh, Viet Cong basically entailed a, an all-pervasive system of corruption. Basically, criminal syndicates were given a free hand to corrupt anybody and everybody they could. What they did was to liber literally establish a community of graft whereby everybody was corrupted, everybody was in on the take, and in exchange for this, they provided information and became, in essence, anti-communist informants. This was, a, uh, as an anti-communist tactic, or at least as an anti-terrorism tactic, was very effective. However, it basically created, literally, a criminal community in Vietnam, which in Saigon, which embraced not only the top officials, but just about everybody. Everybody literally was on the take. That's what made it so effective. So what, you were, what they were really doing, in effect, was criminalizing the entire society. Now, Nien Cao Ki, uh, again, at one time president, another time vice president of the Vietnamese Republic, also head of the Air Force in Vietnam and currently, by the way, living in the United States and reportedly involved in criminal activities, including narcotics trafficking in the United States. Nien Cao Ki and his assistant, General Nien Nhoc Loan, oversaw this system, and financing this all-pervasive system of corruption and intelligence was, you guessed it, the opium traffic. Reading from Alfred McCoy's book. Although he was enormously popular with the Air Force, Key had neither an independent political base nor any claim to leadership of a genuine mass movement when he took office. This was the office of Premier, uh, the highest political office in South Vietnam. A relative newcomer to politics, Key was hardly known outside elite circles. Also, Key seemed to lack the money, the connections, and the capacity for intrigue necessary to build up an effective ruling faction and restore Saigon's security. But he solved these problems in the traditional Vietnamese manner by choosing a power broker, a, quote, heavy, as Machiavellian and corrupt as Bay Vien or Ngo, or Ngo Dinh Yu. This man was General Nguyen Nguyen Lon. L-O-A-N. Lon was easily the, the brightest of the young Air Force officers. His career was marked by rapid advancement and assignment to such technically demanding jobs as commander of the Light Observation Group and assistant commander of the Tactical Operations Center. Lon also had served as deputy commander to Key, an old classmate and friend, in the aftermath of the anti jam coup. Shortly after Key took office, he appointed Lon director of the Military Security Service, the MM MSS. Since MSS was responsible for anti-corruption investigations inside the military, Lon was in an excellent position to protect members of Key's faction. Several months later, Lon's power increased significantly when he was also appointed director of the Central Intelligence Organization, CIO, which was South Vietnam CIA, without being asked to resign from the MSS. Finally, in April 1966, Premier Key announced that General Lon had been appointed to an additional post, Director General of the National Police. Only after Lon had consolidated his position and handpicked his successors did he, quote, step down as Director of the MSS and CIO. 
Not even under Diem had one man controlled so many political, police and intelligence agencies. In the appointment of Lon uh, to all three posts, the interests of Key and the Americans coincided. While Premier Key was using Lon to build up political machine, a political machine, the U.S. mission was happy to see a strong man take command of, quote, Saigon's police and intelligence communities, unquote, to drive the NLF out of the capital. Lieutenant Colonel Lucien Conin says that Lawn's, Lawn was given wholehearted U.S. support because, quote, we wanted effective security in Saigon above all else, and Lawn could provide that security. Lawn's activities were placed beyond reproach, and the whole three-tiered U.S. advisory structure at the district, province, and national level was placed at his disposal. The liberal naivete that had marked the Kennedy diplomats in the last few months of Jem's regime was decidedly absent. Gone were the qualms about, quote, police state tactics and daydreams that Saigon could be secure and politics, quote, stabilized without using funds available from the control of Saigon's lucrative rackets. When the, with the encouragement of Key and the tacit support of the U.S. mission, Lon, whom the Americans called Laughing Larry because he frequently burst into a high-pitched giggle, revived the Bin Zoyan formula for using systematic corruption to combat urban guerrilla warfare. Rather than purging the police and intelligence bureaus, Lawn forged an alliance with a specialist who had been running these agencies for the last 10 to 15 years. According to Lieutenant Colonel Conan, quote, the same professionals who organized corruption for GM and New were still in charge of police and intelligence. Lawn simply passed the word among these guys and put the old system back together again, unquote. Under Lawn's direction, Saigon's security improved markedly. With the, quote, door-to-door surveillance network perfected by Dr. Tuyen back in action, police were soon swamped with information. A U.S. Embassy official, Charles Sweet, who was then engaged in urban pacification work, recalls that in 1965 the NLS was act- NLF excuse me, was actually holding daytime rallies in the 6th, 7th, and 8th districts of Cholon, and terrorist incidents were running over 40 a month in District 8 alone. Lawn's methods were so effective, however, that from October 1966 until January 1968, there was not a single terrorist incident in District 8. In January 1968, correspondent Robert Chaplin reported that Lawn, ha- quote, has done what is generally regarded as a good job of tracking down communist terrorists in Saigon, unquote. Putting the old system back together again, of course, meant reviving large-scale corruption to finance the cash rewards paid to these part-time agents whenever they delivered information. Lawn and the police intelligence professionals systematized the corruption, regulating how much each particular agency would collect, how much each officer would skim off for his personal use, and what percentage would be turned over to Key's political machine. Excessive individual corruption was rooted out, and Saigon Cholon's vice rackets, protection rackets and payoffs were strictly controlled. After several years of watching law and system in action, Charles Sweet feels that there were four major sources of, of graft in South Vietnam. One, sale of government jobs by generals or their wives. Two, administrative corruption, graft, kickbacks, bribes, etc. Three, military corruption, theft of goods and payroll frauds. And four, the opium traffic. And, out of the four, Sweet has concluded that the opium traffic was undeniably the most important source of illicit revenue. Now, we looked at how American GIs were being addicted to heroin, being flown in by the CIA uh, via Air America, grown in Laos by the CIA's so-called secret Hmong or Mayo uh, army, and basically that the dominant traffickers in South Vietnam, at whose behest all of this was being done, of course it was being used to finance the arms and fighting capacity of the Hmong, but the people involved in turning this heroin traffic around in Vietnam were the basically the, the group of Vietnamese officials and soldiers and flyers around Nien Cao Ki, and this was the dominant individual responsible for getting all of these GIs addicted. Continuing, and uh, again, Nien Cao Ki, the dominant person involved in the uh, heroin traffic, or the opium traffic from Laos to Vietnam, and consequently winding up in the veins of the GIs. Continuing with McCoy's account. Of South Vietnam's three major narcotics rings, the air transport wing loyal to Air Vice Marshal Ki must still be considered the most professional. Although Ki's apparatus lost control over the internal distribution network following his post-Tet political decline in 1968, his faction continues to manage much of the narcotics smuggling between Vietnam and Laos through the Air Force and its relations with Laotian traffickers. With over 10 years of experience, it has connections with the Lao elite that the other two factions cannot even hope to equal. 
Rather than buying heroin through a maze of middlemen, Key's apparatus deals directly with a heroin laboratory operating somewhere in the Vientiane region. According to, to a U.S. police advisor stationed in Vientiane, this laboratory is supposed to be one of the most active in Laos and is managed by a Chinese entrepreneur named Hu Tim Heng. Heng is the link between one of Laos, Laos's major opium merchants, General Wan Ratikon, former commander-in-chief of the Laotian army, and the air transport wing heroin ring. From the viewpoint of the narcotics traffic, Hu Tim Heng's most important legitimate commercial venture is the Pepsi-Cola bottling factory on the outskirts of Vientiane. With Prime Minister Suvana Fuma's son Panya as the official president, Heng and two other Chinese financiers began construction in 1965 and 6. Although the presence of the Prime Minister's son at the head of the company qualified the venture for generous financial support from USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the plant has still not bottled a single Pepsi after five years of stop-start construction. The completed factory building has a forlorn, abandoned look about it. While Pepsi's competitors are mystified at the company's lackadaisical attitude, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics has an answer to the riddle. Bureau sources report that Heng has been using his Pepsi operation as a cover for purchases of chemicals vital to the processing of heroin, such as ether and acetic anhydride, and for large financial transactions. Once the heroin is processed and packaged in large plastic envelopes, other experienced members of the key apparatus take charge of arranging shipment to South Vietnam. Mrs. Nguyen T. Lee, T. Key's older sister, last name by the way, T-H-I-L-Y, Key's elder sister had directed much of the traffic from the Sedon Palace Hotel in Pak Se when, while her brother was premier. But in 1967, she gave up her position as manager and moved back to Saigon. However, sources in Vientiane's Vietnamese community report that she and her husband have traveled between Saigon, Pak Se, and Vientiane at least once a month since they returned to Vietnam. Mrs. Lee purchases, purchases heroin produced in Hu Tim Heng's clandestine laboratory and has it shipped to Pak Se or Nam Pen, where it is picked up by Vietnamese Air Force transports. In addition, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics believes that General Lone's old assistant, Mai Den, may also be involved in this operation. After General Lone was wounded in May of 1968, Mai Den was forced out of his position as director of the CIO's Foreign Intelligence Bureau, and he exiled himself to Bangkok. For two years, this wily chameleon had used his CIO agents to weave a net of drug contacts across the Golden Triangle, and the Bureau of Narcotics has reason to believe he may still be using them. Normally, those Air Force officers responsible for directing the flow of narcotics to South Vietnam purchase the drugs and have them delivered, often by the Laotian Air Force, to points in Laos, particularly Pak Se, or else across the border in Pleiku Province, South Vietnam, or in Nam Pen, Cambodia. Most observers feel that the Cambodian capital has preempted Play Coup's importance as a drop point since the Vietnamese Air Force began daily sorties to Phnom Penh during the 1970 Cambodia invasion. In August of 1971, the New York Times reported that the director of Vietnam Customs, quote, said he believed that planes of the South Vietnamese Air Force were the principal car carriers of heroin coming into South Vietnam, unquote. While the director is a two appointee and his remark may be politically motivated, U.S. Customs advisor, more objective ob advisors, more objective observers, have stated that the Air Force regularly unloads large quantities of smuggled narcotics at Tanzanut Air Base. Here, Air Vice Marshal Key reigns like a feudal baron in his air-conditioned palace, surrounded by only his most loyal officers. As one U.S. Air Force advisor put it, quote, in order to get a job within shooting distance of the vice presidential palace, a VA VNAF officer has to be intensely loyal to key. So summing up this passage that uh, we just finished reading, not only are the Hmong tribesmen, the uh, CIA's so-called secret army, growing the, the uh, opium in Laos, not only is CIA's Air America flying it in to South Vietnam, but the key traffickers in Vietnam, and of course remember that the key victims and addicts are American GIs, the key traffickers in Vietnam are the key elements of the government, and key there is not meant as a pun, specifically Nhien Cao Ki, Air Vice Marshal, head of the Vietnamese Air Force, one-time President of the Republic, for a long time Vice President under General Chu, and it's worth noting that the main refinery from which the key ring is getting, <laughs> that's a great, but from which the key narcotics Narcotics organization is getting its uh, its heroin and its opium is, is being bottled at a but basically it's at a plant which is ostensibly a Pepsi Cola bottling plant. It is not actually a Pepsi Cola bottling plant. It is in a, it is actually a heroin laboratory. Nonetheless, that heroin laboratory again being used by the key by the key narcotics uh, organization by the Hmong tribes and by CIA to fly heroin into South Vietnam where it's going into the veins of our GIs. 
that plant is being subsidized by the U.S. Agency for International Development, itself often used as a conduit for U.S. intelligence. And Nip Tuck's going to give you a very piece of interesting information about a well-known American politician who played a very important role in getting that plant set up. You can tell us late in the show, a very piece of information interesting, a very interesting information. We'll try that one again. We both got it wrong. A very interesting piece of information. This is from The Great Heroin Coup by Henry Kruger. Just a short segment. In August 1971, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs announced the location in Southeast Asia of 29 drug refineries, 15 of them allegedly producing heroin. Among the largest was one in Vientiane, Laos, which was camouflaged as a Pepsi-Cola plant. Richard Nixon, representing Pepsi's interests in 1965, had promoted its construction. Though the plant never capped a bottle, it continued to be subsidized by U.S. Aid for International Development. So Richard Nixon, who at the time of, among other things, the Kennedy assassination, was working for the Pepsi-Cola company, uh, it was the one who promoted the... Uh, foundation of that plant in Vientiane, which became the leading heroin refinery in all of Southeast Asia, never capped a bottle of Pepsi. Uh, the heroin, as Dave said, went straight into the arms of American GIs, and yet uh, the American taxpayers supported it through the USAID. And again, the uh, the uh, main person trafficking in that heroin, which was, was uh, be going into the arms of the GIs, was Nien Kao Ki, a key official of the government that those GIs were there to, to uh, support in the first place. Uh, obviously a distasteful situation. We're going to conclude this particular Radio Free America broadcast by taking a look at something which, in a sense, will provide a bridge to future programs, namely the evolution of the Southeast Asian heroin, uh, heroin traffic into a Southeast Asian heroin production operation into a major exporter of heroin to the crime syndicates bringing it into the United States. Not only is it being used... To, uh, is, is it being used to supply the habits of American GIs? It, the, the, the Southeast Asian heroin fair, opium fields eventually were to become a major factor in supplying the domestic American addicts' habit. By the way, broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. And remember now, the, the key organization's role, that is KY organization's role, in the narcotics trafficking because apparently the uh, decision, the, the U.S. authorities in Vietnam, particularly General Edward Lansdale, one of the prime architects of America's military and political policy there, decided to overlook that uh, the role of the Corsican syndicate in the Saigon heroin trafficking and in the Southeast Asian role in general. The Corsicans, obviously, uh, Vietnam was a French, uh, Indochina was a French colony. The Corsicans wound up there as well. And those, the Corsicans and the Vietnamese heroin traffic, as the Corsicans began contracting with Nien Cao Ki to get uh, Vietnamese heroin sent to their Marseille laboratories, American authorities decided to overlook this connection. And we're going to take a look at Santo Traficante, who made a trip to Saigon and may very well have been involved with getting Vietnamese Vietnamese heroin himself. At any rate, this uh, last passage is going to serve as sort of a bridge to our next broadcast. This is the concluding passage for this program from Alfred McCoy's Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. It is particularly unfortunate that General Lansdale decided to arrange, quote, some kind of truce, unquote, with the Corsicans during the very period when Marseille's heroin laboratories were probably beginning the changeover from Turkish to Southeast Asian morphine base. In a mid-1971 interview, Lieutenant Colonel Conin said that power brokers and Premier Key's apparatus contacted the leaders of Saigon's Corsican underworld in 1965 and 6 and agreed to let them start making large drug shipments to Europe in exchange for a fixed percentage of the profits. By October of 1969, these shipments had become so important to Marseille's heroin laboratories that, according to Conin, there was a summit meeting of Corsican syndicate bosses from around the world at Saigon's Continental Palace Hotel. Syndicate leaders from Marseille, Bangkok, Vientiane, and Phnom Penh flew in for the meeting, which discussed a wide range of international rackets, but probably focused on reorganizing the narcotics traffic. According to one well-informed U.S. diplomat in Saigon, the U.S. Embassy has a reliable Corsican informant who claims that similar meetings were also held in 1968 and 1970 at the Continental Palace. Most significantly, American Mafia boss Santo Traficante Jr. visited Saigon in 1968, and is believed to have contacted Corsican syndicate leaders there. Vietnamese police officials report that the current owner of the Continental Palace is Philippe Francini, the heir of Mathieu Francini, the reported organizer of currency and opium smuggling rackets between Saigon and Marseille during the first Indochina War. Police officials also point out that some of Key's strongest supporters in the Air Force, Transport Division Com Commander Colonel Fang Phong Tien, is close to many Corsican gangsters, 
and has been implicated in the smuggling of drugs between Laos and Vietnam. From 1965 to 1967, General Lansdale's senior liaison office worked closely with Premier Key's administration, and the general himself was identified as one of the young premier's stronger supporters among U.S. mission personnel. One can only wonder whether Conine's and Lansdale's willingness to grant the Corsicans a truce, unquote, and overlook their growing involvement in the American heroin traffic might not have been motivated by political considerations, i.e., their fear of embarrassing Premier Key. All right, so a quick summation tonight. We realize uh, and that with these archive broadcasts, you're listening to an awful lot of uh, strange names, especially tonight's broadcast with all the, the uh, Italian and Corsican and French and uh, uh, Sicilian and now uh, Laotian and Vietnamese and Thai names. That's very complicated. This is the reason, of course, that we advocate taping them. In just a moment, um, Dave is going to tell you about uh, where you can get a tape if you were not able to tape this broadcast yourself. Just to cap the, the main high points, just so you can go go. Away Way with this clear, uh, we talked probably about. Should, probably should call them the most significant. The most. In the yeah, context. that's right. We're going to stay away from. It's key like, ta- it's like talking about the key ring. You know? Yeah, we're going to stay away from key for the rest of the day, um, capping the most significant points off and. Uh, uh, what started as originally a marriage of convenience between American intelligence and the American military and uh, certain uh, underworld organizations, namely the uh, the Corsican Union Corse underworld gang and, of course, the Sicilian Mafia, um, re- after becoming originally a marriage of convenience for political purposes so that these groups could be used to suppress labor and leftist political organizations in Europe at the end of World War II, before very long... Uh, the uh, intelligence forces of France and the United States found out how very valuable uh, the opium traffic that these underworld gangs were involved in could be and how uh, very uh, lucrative they could be in terms of uh, being able to use the money to supply political forces. Um, of course, also the same thing happened in uh, China, where Chiang Kai-shek's uh, intelligence operation was based almost entirely upon uh, upon drug dealing gangs. And later, when the United States began to have liaison directly with Chiang Kai-shek's intelligence chief, that liaison was in fact right through the same network and operations. So later on, when France and then after them, the United States made Southeast Asia the focus of much of their policy for Asia and stopping communism. Uh, the combination of these things, the French connections into the opium traffic and, of course, the profound involvement of Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Chinese uh, uh, refugees, the KMT, the Kuomintang, uh, meant that the United States would become more and more involved with the heroin traffic, and eventually, by the late 1950s and the mid-1960s, the United States was actively involved to the extent of having a CIA proprietary airline, Air America, actually flying Laotian opium uh, down from the hills to the flatlands, and opium that later wound up being refined in a Pepsi-Cola bottling plant that was uh, open with the help of Richard Nixon and subsidized by the United States Aid for International Development, heroin that eventually wound up going into the arms and veins of United States GIs and coming back to the United States in the biggest heroin boom this country has ever seen. Courteous of the, the courtesy of the people who we were there to defend in the first place. Absolutely. And so now we're going to be looking in the next few broadcasts at some of the ways that heroin and cocaine and other drugs have become an intimate part of our intelligence establishment uh, political agenda. Now, if for some reason you were unable to tape this broadcast, and I think you'll agree that it's a, a difficult program to simply try and assimilate by uh, through casual listening, all of our archive shows, all at this point 24 Radio Free America shows, our Four Guns of November programs, and other miscellaneous broadcasts are available from a tape duplication service. The name of that service is DAVCOR, D-A-V as in Victor, K-O-R-E. They're located at Suite 1300 D. As in DAVCOR, Space Park Way. Three words just like it sounds, Space Park Way. It's right down by the NASA Ames facility. That's in Mountain View. The zip code is 94043. Phone number is area code 415-969-3030. Write or phone to the attention of Paul. Once again, DAVCOR, Suite 1300D, Space Park Way, Mountain View, California, 94043. Area code 415 969 3030. And again, neither Nip nor myself nor KFJC makes a sue off of that. We don't make any money off of it. This is strictly, literally, FYI and for your convenience as well. 
All right. Now stay tuned for Radio Dada, which has graciously allowed us to run a few minutes over. That will be on until 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we will be back Sunday with our regular One Step Beyond broadcast from 8 to 11. And as soon as we have a date in approximately four to five weeks from now for our next Radio Free America broadcast, we will give you that. Right. Uh, don't forget, by the way, May Brussels World Watchers International, Sunday morning at 9. During the third hour of next One Step Beyond, we're going to be rebroadcasting the May Brussels tape that would normally have been broadcast this evening. All right. Thank you for joining us. This is Nip Tuck for Dave Emery saying good night. And uh, be back with us next time for more Radio Free America here on KFJC.